Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you from different parts of the world. And we will wait for a few minutes as everyone joins us. So the, uh, the International Federation of Surveyors, FIG Climate Compass Task Force, welcomes you to our second regional seminar and Climate Compass Task Force annual meeting of a four-year series on surveying and climate. Three seminars are being held across the major global time zones to reach all surveyors interested in climate, no matter what, around the, the world. This seminar is focused on Asia Pacific and the Americas. And, and we have one more seminar uh, tomorrow on the 22nd. And these seminars are about regionally relevant case studies showing opportunities and gaps for surveying and climate. So I'm Clarissa Augustinus and I co-chair this FIG task force together with Roshni Sharma. And the two of us will be co-chairing and facilitating the seminar today with uh, the committee who is also facilitating. We represent both sides of the task force, young surveyors and seasoned surveyors. I am an honorary FIG, honor, uh, uh, I'm an honorary FIG ambassador and have supported the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. And I now represent FIG on the FAO UNCCD Joint Partnership Initiative on Land Tenure and land degradation neutrality. Roshni works for Frontier SI, an innovative Australian geospatial company, and is on the Geospatial Council of Australia. So the purpose of this seminar is to bring together surveyors with an interest in climate from around the world to map our expertise so we can help to catalyze a better future for people and the planet. Next, let's have a look at some housekeeping. Um, we invite you to already start introducing yourselves and your organization in the chat. And please put into the chat links any items you think are interesting or useful for this audience about any aspect of surveying and climate issues. We can also potentially use the information for the upcoming planned FIG publication. Please keep your microphones off until we start the question time after the speakers. Questions will be taken from the Q&A for the first round of questions to the panel. Please start putting questions in the Q&A right now. Our, uh, Roshni and our team will facilitate and, and review these questions uh, off, after the speakers in the Q&A and use them to generate an interactive session. Once we start the interactive plenary session, please keep your video and microphone on and use the room, the Zoom raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen if you want to speak. You will then enter the queue to speak. And we really want you to contribute your voice. So that's the key, as this is the key purpose of this event. Apologies, the seminar is in English only, and all questions, written or spoken, need to be in English. The seminar and task force meeting will be four hours long and is recorded. And the seminars aspect will take place for three and a half hours. The task force meeting will follow the seminar and last half an hour. All meetings, participants are welcome to join the task force meeting. After the seminar, the recording will be made available on our FIG Climate Compass Task Force YouTube channel, alongside our other events. Courtesy of Dana Heyman, the seminar will be mind mapped and live scribed, and you will see this emerge during the plenary session of the seminar. Finally, the presentations and interactive discussions recorded during the seminar will be contributed to an FIG publication. Next, so have a, let's have a look at the content background. Next, the seminar is about how surveyors can use spatial data and technologies, digital transformation and innovation for climate action. 
Together, we will be defining and assessing what the big global land, carbon and biodiversity issues are that are relevant for surveyors working at national and local levels. This means thinking about what the legal, policy, financial and capacity implications are for rolling out new solutions at the scale necessary. Opportunities will be identified for the development of the future of the surveying profession, including technical opportunities and how surveying education needs to be rethought. Next, let's have a look at the structure of the seminar. So after this introduction and housekeeping, I will open with a rapid overview of the, U the UN climate goals on carbon, biodiversity, and land degradation, restoration, and how they are linked to surveyors. We will then hear from three expert practitioner speakers on a diverse range of case studies on climate resilience. Each of them will present for 20 minutes. And to make the seminars interactive as possible, after the three speakers have finished, there will be three facilitated sessions, one for each speaker topic. And then the facilitators will also give us a five minute wrap up. This will all take about 40 minutes, facilitated by our organization, organizing team. Then we will have an interactive plenary session of about one and a half hours. First, each of the breakaway sessions, sorry, first, each of the uh, speaker facilitators will report back to the plenary. And then we will hear a presentation of, of a live scribe by Dana, followed by Roshni walking us through a Kinefin framework to help stimulate our thinking further on the role of surveyors in climate action. And participants can put questions in, Q, in the Q&A or raise hands and speak directly to presenters in the next general interactive session. It's, it's the main plenary that we will go through to. This will be facilitated by Roshni. This is where we can all learn, share and solve problems during the discussion. And it will continue to be live mapped, uh, mind mapped and live scribed by Dana, who will then make a final presentation at the end of the plenary before Roshni closes the seminar and we transition into the task force first annual meeting. This meeting is open to all. Please consider continuing to join us at the end of the seminar. We will aim to end the seminar part of this meeting in three and a half hours at 2.30 a.m. GMT on the 22nd. The annual task force meeting will follow immediately for half an hour and end at 3 a.m. GMT on the 22nd. Oh, thank you for that. And that's our introduction. Now we will transition and I will present on um, what do the global climate goals mean for land, water and marine surveying. Thank you. Next. So there are nine, scientists have identified nine planetary boundaries that humanity dare not cross, otherwise we endanger our future. Surveyors are vital to the management of all these boundaries. The three zones we see here in red that surveyors can do something about are carbon, biodiversity, and land use change, noting that 13 to 20% of global emissions annually are linked to land use change. Next. So the government and people of the world have set goals which allow us to protect people and the planet regarding carbon, biodiversity, and land use change. So we hear the words COP28 or limit global warming to 1.5 degrees or biodiversity loss or land degradation neutrality. So what does this all mean for surveyors and how do we engage? I'm going to take you on a very rapid tour to give us the background to these terms and show why it's important for surveyors. In 1992, the governments of the world held a conference in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil called the Earth Summit. At the meeting, the governments decided humanity should address the interconnected challenges facing the planet of climate change, desertification, and biodiversity loss. All three of these are linked to land, water, and marine surveying. To address these challenges, the governments at the Earth Summit founded three sister Rio conventions, 
which are supported by UN entities overseen by the governments of the world. The government's role is known as the Conference of the Parties, hence the word COPs, and governments are the parties. These conventions and the name of the UN entity supporting them are the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, also known as UN Climate Change, and it deals with carbon-related issues and, cl and climate change. Examples of this in regard to land are forests and reforestation. The Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, also known as UN Biodiversity. It deals with the protection of biodiversity, for instance, uh, indigenous forests. The third one is the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. It deals with land degradation, drought and desertification, and the land tenure aspects linked to this land use and advocates for land degradation neutrality, which I will define just now. So each of the three conventions hold meetings, what we call COPs, every few years. The number of the COP shows how many COPs have been held by the particular Rio Convention since the original Rio meeting. The most recent well-known one is the Climate Change COP28, which was held in Dubai in 2023. The CBD Convention also holds COPs, and its latest COP15 was held in 2022, where it adopted a new set of goals for biodiversity called the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, GBF, to which 188 governments committed. Among its goals are conserve and manage 30% of the Earth's terrestrial and marine areas by 2030, and restore 30% of degraded ecosystems by 2030. The UNCCD Convention also holds COPs, and its latest COP15 was held in 2022, where it agreed to accelerate the restoration of 1 billion hectares of degraded land by 2030. Next. Here are four examples of the kind of things that come out of COPs. So um, each COP at a convention produces a range of policies, resolutions, declarations, and agreements by partners, many of which impact the work of surveyors. Often the impact is not absolutely clear because of the climate technical language being used and the global scale of their analysis. Let's have a look at the first example. COP14 of UNCCD decision of parties, uh, to, uh, decision 26 calls for land tenure issues to be addressed and among other things, encourages governments to adopt national land governance legislation to support sustainable land use and restoration, land restoration and recognize legitimate land rights, including customary rights. Uh, UNFCCCC COP28 Agriculture, Food and Climate National Action Toolkits, signed by 130 countries, for the first time saw food and agriculture become in, important within a climate discussion. And governments were urged to align and integrate food and agriculture within national strategies, including NDCs and national adaptation plans. UNFCCC COP26 declaration, the Glasgow Declaration on Forests and Land Use. This declaration was endorsed by 145 countries covering 90% of forests. These countries are committed to working collectively to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030, while delivering sustainable development and promoting an inclusive rural transformation. This involves forests and other ecosystem conservation, redesigning agriculture, aligning finance, sustainable production and consumption, and recognizing indigenous peoples and local communities. And then UNCBD COP15, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, as I already indicated, sets aside 30% of the Earth's surface, terrestrial and marine, for conservation by 2030, and 30% of degraded land to be restored by 2030. Noting that 20 to 40% of the world's land is already degraded. The land and water governance impacts of all of this are enormous and surveyors have a vital role in sorting out 
Who gets what where and for what purpose? Next. The world's governments have committed to support. Next. The world's governments have committed to support these goals and they do this by producing national environment plans that are part of the UN reporting process on how we are doing in meeting our climate goals. Most governments have three sets of national plans relating to the environment. Each plan is linked to a different United Nations Rio Convention. The three sets of national reports often don't align with each other. And you can find your country's three reports on the web using those links. These reports are known as NDCs, NBSAPs, and LDN targets. And I will explain them here quickly. By the way, the map here of Australia in purple, you will see the land degradation areas mapped. So let's start with climate. Governments supply a nationally determined contribution NDC report to UNFCCC. This is a climate action plan to cut emissions and adapt to climate impacts. Each party or government to the Paris Agreement is required to develop an NDC and update it every five years. Note that the next update is in 2025. As of 2022, there were 193 parties to the Paris Agreement with 166 NDC reports. Biodiversity. So governments supply what's known as an NBSAP or a National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans report to UNCBD. These national reports outline national strategies, plans or programs for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity and provide strategic direction at national level on the management and protection of biodiversity. There are 196 governments that have signed on to this convention and we have 185 NBSAP reports. Land degradation. Governments supply a land degradation neutrality report to UNCCD. LDN, as it's known, is a state whereby the amount and quality of land resources necessary to support ecosystem functions and services and enhance food security remain stable or increase within specific temporal and spatial scales and ecosystems. 129 countries have committed to setting LDN targets and there are 100 LDN reports. Of interest for this audience, there is a group on Earth observation that supports the UNCCD on the SDG monitoring of LDN and reporting and all national governments have been provided by this Earth observation group with default data on land cover, land productivity, and soil organic carbon derived from global data sources. Next. So what does this mean for surveyors? Surveyors are vital to the achievement of all three Rio conventions and the future of the, pu fu future of the planet and people. And in this seminar, we are asking ourselves, what are the key roles that surveyors are already playing regarding measuring, managing, and mitigating the present and future impacts of climate change? What specific knowledge and capacity do surveyors have to help achieve the global goals of the Rio Conventions? And what capacity development is still needed for surveyors working on the climate crisis? Next. So let's have a quick look at the types of surveying work. Surveyors have a major role in monitoring and measuring, um, in, in both in implementing surveying aspects of the national climate plans, in managing land use change, causing carbon and biodiversity loss, in strengthening land systems for tenure security and spatial planning and land use controls, improving geospatial data and mapping. Well, here we're talking about collection, analysis, management, monitoring and measurement. And then also strengthening valuation systems, natural accounting of natural resources, risk management, carbon offsets, compensation and property markets, and of course, uh, measuring and monitoring sea level rise and coastal zones. And then of course, natural disaster and building back better. So this is what we have come to learn in these seminars. Thank you very much. Next. So I would like to introduce you to our three speakers. Prof. Rushan Shen, 
of Shanghai Zhongtong University in China, is a director of the Urban Climate Change Research Network, UCCRN, East Asian Hub. He has been involved in high-level global assessments and reports of intergovernmental platforms on biodiversity and ecosystem services, IPBES, and he will speak on climate change, disaster management, and carbon neutra neutrality initiatives in China, with a particular focus on cities. Ms. Kate Fowley has a master's from Oxford University in sustainable development, and she works for a globally respected Australian surveying company, Land Equity International, as a land administration specialist. From their work in the region, she will present four case studies from Asia Pacific, linking land and climate. And then Dr. Sharice Griffith Charles is a senior lecturer at the Department of Geomatics Engineering and Land Management at the University of West Indies in the Caribbean. She will speak on informal settlement regularization, disaster management and small island developing states, SIDS, using the extensive work she has done on this in the field. Thank you. I, we are now going to hand over to Professor Chen. The floor is yours, you have 20 minutes. Okay, right. can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Hello, Ara. I'm Ri Shantung from Shanghai Jiao Tung University of China. Today, my topic is climate change impacts and responses in China. So uh, first, uh, you know, I will talk about the climate change and in impacts in China, and then, you know, help you understand the problem of climate change you know, that uh, what the climate change brings or impacts in China. And then, you know, I will talk about what we did in China to mitigate and also adapt to the climate change. And finally, I will give you some uh, result and also implications maybe for not only for China, but also for other countries. As you know, uh, as you can see, you know, the average temperature has increased in China since 1970s. And especially in recent 20 years, you see the, we had a very big change of the temperature. And the, the temperature change, the average temperature change, uh, it brings a lot of problems. First is the increase in heat, wave, heat waves. And sometimes the temperature in cities can go up to 15 degrees. And the number and duration of uh, heat waves in cities are increasing. You see, sometimes you know that makes us uncomfortable. And also, you can see, because of climate change, we have more, uh, more strong rain, rain, rain. You know, these years, and that bring us a lot of uh, flood in, in the city in the urban areas. Nowadays, we see more and more extreme rainfall and flood. You know that, especially these uh, after two, uh, 2020, you know, it brings us a lot of problems in Jinju and other cities. Uh, in the coastal areas, the sea level the sea level is rising, and the tropical clouds and storm surge are intensifying which is not only in China, but also in other place, other countries, led to more coastal flood. And a, a lot of people was died because of the increase of flood, and also a lot of uh, uh, properties was affected. Taking Shanghai as an example, you can see, you know, the in the downtown areas of Shanghai, if someone went to Shanghai before, you can understand these two, these pictures of you know, this area uh, in the downtown area, uh, a lot of uh, properties, you know, the uh, located the, in this area, you will see, you know, the the area will be flooded because of climate, you know, because of climate change. Uh, after two degree and four degree of warming, most of this area will be have uh, nearly uh, 20 centimeters of water depths. 
this will have very big impacts for transportation, for a lot of other things. Not only because of flooding, climate change also increased drought frequency and air carriage in China. Make cities, like even the coastal cities like Shanghai, will have a severe water shortage problems. We see China, uh, climate change have already had a great impact in China. What do we have done and are doing to reduce the climate change impacts of, uh, from, uh, you know, from the long-term perspective? I think the mitigation is very important. China, you can see, I think most of you understand, China's carbon emission is about one third of the global total. We are the largest carbon emitter in the world. But uh, per capita, but if you can see, you know, the per capita emission in China is still very low. You know, it's nearly one half of the U.S. and also one half of the of Australia. In two thousand twenty-one, China's President Xi Jinping pledged to peak CO two emission before twenty thirteen and also reach the carbon neutrality by twenty sixteen. It's because of these goals, you know, China's total emission and fossil fuel energy consumption will decline rapidly after 2030. You know, if without these kind of uh, goals, you know, the carbon, em carbon emission will be stable and uh, every year that we em emit a lot. But because of these goals, you know, in, after 2030, we can see a very rapid decline of the carbon emission. This goal will be achieved by uh, several uh, techniques. You know, first by improving re resources efficiency, also by taking clean energy transition, this uh, carbon capture utilization, and also carbon uh, sequestration in the terrestrial area in the ecosystems, and uh, finally carbon finance. That is also very important for achieving the carbon neutrality. China has made great success in reducing the carbon intensity, increase the forest carbon stock and wind and solar power since 2050. You can see even last nearly seven day, seven years, China already make a very great success. Especially you can see the uh, CO2 emission per unit of GDP decreased more than 65% uh, in past uh, six, six years. So this is very, very big success. Also, you can see the wind and solar power installed capacity also increased a lot. Currently, China produced more than 75% uh, of global solar power, solar PV manufacturing capacity. Increased the significant, uh, especially we can see, you know, compared to uh, 2010 to 2021, um, these nearly 10, uh, 11 years, China, the, the manufacturing capacity increased a lot. Nowadays, you can see, you know, China, we only used nearly 13% of that, but we export a lot to other countries. Uh, China also produced enough solar and wind energy to cover our own residential electricity. So that means, you know, in what we use in our household, that's most, you know, that can totally from the solar and wind uh, sources. If you travel to China, I think some of you maybe already traveled to China. If you try to China, you will find many mountains, mountain areas, and also the desert areas that work covered totally by the solar panels. You can see there's a very, very big change. And also, you know, China developed some new types of ecological, uh, ecological restoration, uh, uh, restoration approach, you know, such as, you know, you can see in the finger, in the fruit, you know, we, we uh, above the, above the land, we have the, uh, solar panels and below the solar panels, you know, the grass can grow and we have a lot of growth, a lot, a lot of sheep can grow there. So this can help the poverty elevation also in the 
poor areas. We also installed solar panels on the rooftops. You can see not only in the urban area, but also in the rural areas, which provide a lot of energy for the families. And China also produces a lot of electricity cars. In 2022, more than half of the electric cars on roads worldwide are found in China. China also exports nearly 35% of global electric, uh, electric vehicles. The infrastructure for electric, electric cars also developed very quickly in this uh, like, uh, four years. We see in 2023, China export 4 million electric cars, which become big news on world media. You know, this, one, this too was from the economist and also from other media, we can see, you know, China explored a lot. China also actively promote energy transition. For example, the five main energy goals and the one plus N climate policy. That's include energy, uh, uh, change the energy structure, industry transition, the circular economy, technology innovation, green finance, and also other aspect. China, uh, from uh, 20th century, I think most of you understand, China promotes the reforestation programs. Currently, China's terrestrial area absorbs 10% of its carbon emission uh, with around one, uh, 100 million tons of C, uh, uh, C, uh, CO2 every year. Uh, China also established a carbon trading system in 2021. We can see, you know, gradually more and more companies joined in the uh, carbon trading system. China also actively adopt to climate, adapt to climate change. Generally, we are adapt to climate change from four aspects, you know, with four approaches. First is a pol policy oriented approach, large scale infrastructures, also the national disaster survey and uh, nature based solutions. You can see China started a large uh, national scale water transfer project also the energy transport project to meet the increasing water demand and the energy demand in the cities. And uh, uh, also, you know, adapted to the climate change. China also developed, uh, you, can, uh, you can understand, you know, because the uh, most of the solar energy was in the western part of China and most of the demand was in the south, uh, the coastal area. So we, de uh, so we developed National ultra fast water grid uh, technology, you know, for meet the energy demand in the east side. China also tried to build sponge cities, you know, to address the flood issues in a lot of big cities because big cities the flood because of climate change the flood in big cities are a very big problem. Now you know we are more, we have more than. 41 spawn seating uh, pilot project in China and every seating with very huge investment, you know, to, to help the help to address the uh, flood issues. China also started its first national disaster risk survey, you know, which is uh, like a, you know, uh, Population census. I think a lot of you understand. You know, many countries every ten years they have the population census. China, they we have the first national disaster risk survey. It's like uh, the population census. Every ten years we will assess. You know how uh, what kind of a uh, um, disaster risk will increase or decrease, and how to address that. You know, we are trying to help to understand all disaster risk because of climate change. Also from a policy side, China initiated national scale uh, land use zoning, population relocation programs, and also you know, river chief systems to adapt to the climate change. And China also promotes the region of ecological civilization at a beautiful China from national scale ecosystem restoration, national parks, and other 
uh, ecological projects. These are all mostly, uh, uh, these are mostly what we did, you know, in China these days. So for um, conclusion and Im complica uh, implications, climate change already have great impacts in China with increasing in, uh, extreme disasters. China is the worst, uh, world's uh, largest carbon emitter regarding to CO2, while carbon uh, emission per capita is still very low compared to US and other developed countries. China is planned to peak carbon emission before 2013 and achieve carbon uh, neutrality before 2016. China has made a great effort for carbon uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation from uh, eco uh, eco ecological civilization vision and also large scale infrastructure and nature based solutions such as sponge seating and national park systems. But we can understand, you know, nowadays, maybe some of you see the news, uh, you are on New York Times and uh, other uh, media, you will see, you know, uh, developed countries like uh, U.S. they are think about, you know, the uh, give more tax on the clean energies of China. So I think, you know, in future, if you want to further success uh, in the uh, climate, uh, in the carbon neutrality, uh, not only in China, but also in other countries. You know, the success still depends, you know, not only in China, but also in you know, China, US, and EU, and other countries. We can work together, you know, to address these issues. Okay, thank you. This is uh, my presentation. Uh, yeah, later we can discuss uh, regarding what we talked about just now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Chen. And uh, a really good example of the rapidity of which governments need to be able to change in order to uh, uh, ad adapt to climate. We are now going to pass over to uh, Kate Fairley. Uh, Kate, the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Just give me a second, I'll start my video as well. Um, I think the, the host needs to enable my video, so I'll leave that to you, Roshni, and otherwise I'll start. Uh, thank you, Clarissa. Thank you, Professor Chen. That was an excellent, uh, here we go, start my video. That was an excellent overview, and likewise with Clarissa, I'm really impressed at how rapidly China is able to mobilise on many of these issues. My partner works in solar, so he's had a long partnership with China, and it's certainly a very interesting uh, field. So I'm hopefully diving down a little bit deeper um, into sort of the land and surveying space. My name is Kate Fairley, as beautifully introduced by Clarissa, thank you very much. Um, I'm a land administration specialist with Land Equity International based in Australia, but um, working uh, across sort of Africa, Asia Pacific um, in terms of what we do. So to start off, let me try and, oh, that's interesting. There we go. Okay, obviously my clicks are a little bit slow. Um, really quick outline. I'm going to try and jump straight into it. I'm going to a deep dive into four case studies, um, projects, probably starting off with a little bit more detail in Nauru and Papua, a little bit less detail in the Mekong and Bangladesh to leave you space to all ask questions. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an overview, a good navigator will always tell you where you're going. Um, let me quickly summarize what I see as the key climate change elements of each of these projects. Um, whilst my background is in surveying, I really feel like I'm working extensively in climate change at the moment. Um, but as part of those, I've also sort of drawn out what I see as sort of the land um, related entry points that we're really working in, in each of these projects. So let us start with Nauru. So Nauru is a tiny island in the Pacific. Um, if we were in the room together, I'd probably do a show of hands to see how many of you knew where it was. Um, and it is a, around 21 square kilometers in area, I think, um, and around a population of 10,000 people. So very, very small, and obviously um, suffering from many of the challenges that many small island states do. So I've 
articulated some of those challenges. Nauru has a long colonial history, um, originally uh, a Melanesian population, um, or still a Melanesian population, but extensively impacted by colonial powers. So they've been variously occupied by the Germans, the Japanese, the British and Australian forces. Um, around 80% of the island has been mined for phosphate. This is um, concentrated in the interior. You can see from this artist's impression. Um, and it means that the interior is now barren, it's uninhabitable, and it's created a further disconnect for the customary landowners. Um, and it requires a huge amount of money in terms of um, rehabilitation, which is the responsibility of the national government. Due to its remoteness, access to housing materials in Nauru is pretty limited. Um, as a result, housing, houses are, mainly, are poorly maintained. Um, there's not really a strong culture of maintenance, but I think that's influenced by the inability to access resources to maintain houses. Um, exacerbating this, there are not enough houses. Many houses are homes to extended families, and this has led to you know, often crowded conditions, which is a common thing in many developing countries. Under, um, Nauru was also particularly exposed during the COVID pandemic. 90% um, of the country's food is imported. So this is a real risk, a recognized risk to ongoing security and sovereignty. All right, and then moving through, Nauru's GDP can be roughly split up into three areas. So the phosphate mining, fishing rights for mainly tuna and Australia's uh, refugee processing center. Uh, at least two of these have relatively uncertain futures dependent on other countries' economies. Um, and then like with other many small island developing states, I'm sure Clarissa, will, uh, Charisse will go into this more, um, Nauru is potentially going to suffer from sea level rise, tidal inundation, storms, um, and already experiencing um, the extremes of water scarcity through to flooding. So the Nauru government introduced the Nauru Higher Ground Initiative, and this has a vision for a safe, secure, and resilient future for Nauru. But what does this mean for LEI? Um, we were brought in um, to help with the development of a, a vision and master plan to achieve this resilient future. And our particular role was around reviewing the tenure needs and supporting social safeguards. So in these two images, you can see Nauru. The first is taken from um, Google Earth and it shows the outline, um, hopefully you can see this, is relatively well populated, um, but it's relatively sparse in the centre. Um, and the team that we've been working with has developed a master plan, which is shown on the right. Um, and this is extending the urban area. You can see sort of where the red circles are um, through to this government owned land called Land Portion 230. Um, custom the island's around 90% customary land. Um, so government typically leases land, but in this unique instance has purchased a land portion to start off, to kick off this higher ground initiative. Um, and a significant area you can see by the green sort of rectangles for agriculture and the green uh, sort of wavy areas, which is for conservation. And these two land uses don't really exist on the island um, today. So what does this mean in terms of what we actually did? The work's ongoing. We've been working there for a couple of years, but we're interrupted by COVID and inability to get on the island. Um, so far, we've reviewed the land tenure situation, looking at the gaps between particularly law and practice, um, and really flagging that existing laws uh, have been written for the heavy dominance of phosphate mining, and they don't actually provide a solid foundation for conservation, for uh, government-owned land. There's no basis for government to own land. Um, for things like compulsory acquisition, which may or may not be something the government wants, um, and so on. Other key components um, include public awareness raising, and I'm probably going to be emphasizing that a lot during this talk. Um, so there's a lot of, I guess we've really put a lot of effort into demonstrating the value of awareness raising, consultation, co-development and co-ownership of land administration approaches. Um, I shouldn't overstate our work, there's still a long way to go, um, but public consultations have commenced. Um, there's a link to the website, um, I think on the previous slide. Um, so some of this information is starting to get out and we're putting in place a process so that people can have more of a say in this master plan moving forward. 
Um, I've included training there, training in terms of particularly dispute resolution and negotiation, because when we're dealing with land, there's a lot of conflict. Um, it's really values based and it's really important that people sort of from the government and from the public feel empowered to have their say, but can also do so in a way that is not going to exacerbate conflict, but might actually lead to a resolution. Um, another task is communicating the role of the cadastre and land information systems, um, and particularly the value of standards, transparent and efficient processes, and how these can underpin national climate change responses, which is what we're talking about here. Um, and the final one is social safeguarding. I don't feel like we routinely mention this in surveying and FIG circles, uh, but I do think that it's pretty fundamental to what we do. Um, it's something that a lot of international development partners are really emphasizing. Um, and a key part of this is really understanding the social impact of, for example, infrastructure projects um, and mitigating those negative impacts, particularly where they may be unfairly experienced by minorities, um, often women, often Indigenous peoples, um, disabled peoples um, and other excluded groups. So um, I don't want to spend too much time on Nauru because there's a lot of other case, um, contexts, but I guess for each of the projects, I've been thinking a little bit about what does this mean in terms of further spaces that we need to address as land professionals? Um, and Nauru is really highlighting for me sort of this intersection with customary land and um, particularly how, you know, international experts, often white experts, um, color, you know, previous colonizers. Um, and in Nauru in particular, customary land ownership covers 90% of the island. So um, it's pretty key. Uh, pretty key. Um, and it's a very tr tricky area. Um, Western surveyors and practitioners need to do better at listening to traditional custodians um, in our own countries as well as internationally. Um, but there's also this nature of customary land practices where they're evolving um, and I guess there's a lot of nuance and they're different in a lot of different geographies. So for Nauru, some of the key questions I think are around how do you maintain um, this customary land ownership and customary practices even though they've been so impacted by colonisation to date? Um, and how can they um, be incentivized or perhaps supported to change in a way that will enable better conservation on the island um, and enable more sustainability on the island? Because at the moment, there's a little bit of um, a disconnect between those different practices. Um, for Nauru as well, there's also the compulsory acquisition question. Um, and I think this goes for other countries as well. Should customary land be able to be compulsorily acquired? Um, so... Those are just some of the questions. There's certainly a lot more, and I'd really welcome um, more discussion on this and um, your own sort of um, perspectives on that. All right, let me move on to Papua, um, a slightly larger population. The Papuan provinces lie in the far east of Indonesia, neighbouring Papua New Guinea. Um, they're some of the most heavily forested in Indonesia, and conserving and protecting these forests is recognised, has been recognised within Indonesia as fundamental to achieving their climate change goals. Um, spatial planning is the work that we were doing in, in Papua and we see it as fundamental to the protection of forests. Deforestation in Indonesia, as you can see, accounts for around 80% of Indonesia's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So they've achieved a huge amount so far um, in terms of addressing that, um, but there's still a long way to go. Um, spatial planning, is a key mechanism to do so, but suffers from many of these areas as listed on the screen. Some of the other challenges are that around 50 million Indonesians are dependent on forests to survive, but forests are typically government owned. Um, conservation protection and production are sort of the different forest designations, um, and there's not a specific designation necessarily for Indigenous peoples, but this is changing. Um, there's also the international element where initiatives such as the Forest um, Law Enforcement, Governance and Trade, um, the EU FLECT, um, which is implemented by the European Union, um, has put in measures in place to reduce illegal logging, um, requiring supply chain traceability, but this needs data um, and it needs the sign on of local governments as well as sort of international bodies. So our project was to establish a technical assistance facility for improved spatial planning and low carbon development um, with a focus on Papua and West Papua provinces. But we also had a, we had the technical assistance facility based in Jakarta um, and then 
so supporting both national and district and provincial level governments. The project was funded by the UK government and was implemented in partnership with the Indonesian government. Um, and in practice, this meant really a lot of partnership. <laughs> so we were strengthening special planning, assisting different governments, but partnering with a range of actors uh, to achieve that. So what have I got here? I've got partnerships first. I've mentioned that already. There were a range of actors. Um, and I guess really recognising that land doesn't exist in isolation, spatial planning doesn't, and these touch on a range of other issues, including health, education, business, so on. So it's really important to build those connections and ensure that we understand what different sectors are doing and that we're all moving in the same direction. A key part of the project was also working across government, which I mentioned before. Um, in Indonesia, the national level standards uh, for spatial data are excellent. Um, and there's really strong capacity at the central levels. But it's such a huge country, a huge population, and there's really large distances to cover. So local capacity is much weaker. Um, meeting some of those strict standards, those strict timeframes can be really difficult coming from the really local level government. So this is where building sustainable capacity comes in. Um, it's not just about instructor-led trainings, but we implemented a number of initiatives like learning on the job, mentoring, coaching, developing peer-to-peer -peer networks, online user forums, lots of different touch points so that when the project finished, when we left, there was still a lot of capacity on the ground um, and people felt empowered to continue their work. Um, community engagement was key. Um, one of the things that I think is really, uh, really cool um, is that the team developed an app to not only allow people to access um, the land and spatial planning data, but to be able to report possible logging infractions. And this then the government staff could investigate. Uh, so this is citizen generated data, but it's incorporating that into the formal domain, uh, which I think is um, really interesting. And also keeping in mind sort of the ethics around of this. So likewise, we're really proud that this project was instrumental in getting customary land information, um, ADAT land, recognized and integrated into district and provincial spatial plants. And we think this was the first instance of that happening. Um, and that was really able to happen because of extensive consultation, um, lots of trust building, um, and this empowered other communities to offer their data rather than us having uh, rather than us asking for it. Um, and you know, really creating that partnership between other communities and government, um, which is a difficult thing to navigate. Um, and then just quickly on innovation, there were a range of other things that were achieved, um, supporting the government around Red Plus, um, recognizing um, the coexistence of sustainable, but also um, of sustainability and conservation, but also indigenous use of forests. Um, yeah, definitely ask more about that. I can go into much more detail. Um, so here's some questions around that. I think that I won't go into too much on them because I probably am running out of time, but I've got a range of questions. Um, all right. Um, we had a project in the Mekong. We've got two projects going on in the Mekong at the moment. Um, one is the Mekong Region Land Governance Project and one is the Transparence, uh, Transformative Land Investment Project. And these really focus around um, policy influence, enabling smallholder farmers, but also connecting with the business sector. Um, I think I'm going to run out of time here, so I'm just going to park them. These are the projects. Um, there was one case study in, in particular that I wanted to talk to, which is around large-scale land concessions in Lao PDR. It's a, you know, a huge way for governments to access money for big scale industry to access land, but there's a huge impact on smallholder farmers. Um, COVID exacerbated all of these political economy dimensions. Um, there was significant migration, but that was stopped. Um, and there's just a, a lack of viability. So COVID really impacted the viability of this project. Um, but it was a nice case of where we were able to sort of link um, the success of smallholder business and building that capacity with tenure security and land restoration. Um, so I'm happy to go into more detail on that later on in the questions. Um, finally, because this links really nicely with what Professor Chen was talking about, um, a case study on Bangladesh, which is looking at um, implementing large scale renewable energy. We had a strong focus on solar, but we were also paying some attention to wind. Um, Bangladesh, is facing a huge crisis. Um, 2023 saw the, the most number of power outages I think they've ever had. And um, they've got significant fuel shortages. 
Um, and funnily enough, transitioning to renewable energy is actually cheaper for them. They would save money. Um, but there's, you know, that ability and that momentum to do so. And access to land is a key limitation, um, limited by both sort of the population and the, the topography, as well as poor quality data. Um, so quickly, I think I know someone on the, the uh, chat mentioned GIS. We developed a decision support system. Um, nothing really that new there, but the new bit that I do want to talk about is that the technical is really hard as we, I mean, sorry, really, really easy as we know, but the social data is hard and some finding that social data, recording that social data and integrating that social data, uh, within, um, GIS systems um, or within spatial data, within policy is also really difficult. Um, so that's something we worked on. We've put a little bit in there, but um, there's still a way to go. And I'm looking to do a bit of a study around what there's a number of decision support tools for um, things like implementing accessing land for solar energy, um, solar and wind. Uh, but I don't think very many of them integrate social data. So I'm looking at sort of how we can integrate that social safeguard information into those kind of tools. All right, so just quickly, um, I've sort of been working on a bit of a thing around why do we do land administration and what are all the different touch points? Um, I think for environment, we've covered a lot. This is definitely not all of them, um, but I think we can really nicely articulate for each of these what the entry points are for surveying. And I know this is something that sort of Roshni, Clarissa and others uh, are working on. So I tried to build out a little bit here in terms of what I think, but I'm happy to have more of a discussion around that. Um, really welcome your questions and insights. And I think that's all for me. Hopefully that wasn't over time. Thank you, Clarissa and team. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Actually, you still had four minutes left. I still got four minutes. There you go. Well, I can go back and talk about a um, <laughs> talk about one of the case studies more if you want. Um, let me see. Well, why why don't you give us that that fourth case study? But just within a three minute uh, quick burst because they really are fascinating. Um, but Bangladesh or the Mekong one. The Mekong one, I the think Mekong is the one, one you missed. Yeah, the, I skipped over that. Apologies, obviously I um, got a bit flustered. Um, all right, well, I overviewed it a little bit, um, but essentially we've been working in four countries in the Mekong um, and really focusing on smallholder farmers and how they can impact the, the policy space. Um, this In this context, um, there was a lot of interest in having um, a large-scale land concession over this area in the Pukea province, which you can see is in the northwest um, of Laupedia. Um, but there's a lot, a lot of problems with large-scale land concessions in the Mekong area. And typically these can lead to deforestation, dispossession, um, indigenous forest dwellers can lose their rights and be you know, evicted from a forest, for one of a better way of saying that. Um, and there's a lot of impact from pesticides where um, the large sort of scale farming um, and even the local farmers to some extent are using pesticides without understanding what the impact can be on sort of the wider ecosystem, but also farmers who might be trying to farm in more sort of organic and natural ways. Um, in this case, there was a boutique. Um, there's a lot of different wild teas in the region, and there was a boutique op an opportunity from an NGO that to develop um, sort of a boutique tea farm. Um, and it was recognised that this is really sought after by you know, particularly Western markets, um, but also a little bit in Laos as well. But the community was lacking a lot of the, the training in terms of identifying the tea varieties, how to market this business, how to do the export, um, different ways of harvesting the tea and different business practices. And these are things as surveyors that we don't normally touch on. Um, but there was a really close linkage between that and tenure security. For example, um, ensuring that different uh, members of the community weren't impinging on each other's rights in terms of either the village boundary or their own individual parcel boundaries, depending on whether that was communal or not. Um, and then also in terms of what the, gov the local government was going to do in terms of allocating that land for land concessions. And often the local people don't have much of a say over whether or not land concession is granted. Um, so in this case, we were able, the team was able to negotiate with government to say, we will make this a viable business. And if we can prove, if we can do that, then you will grant us that tenure security and recognize um, our rights here and not grant the land to the land concession. 
Um, so that was a huge success until COVID hit. Um, when COVID hit, um, that impacted uh, the the viability of the business. Um, they weren't able to sort of get the tea out. Um, and there's, there's no monetary safety net um, there. Whereas and this is a, another political economy thing where often there's a lot of concessions or support that's given to large scale actors, but the recognition is not there for the small scale actors. Um, so I actually need to do a bit more investigating in terms of whether the project is still going, but it was a really nice case of linking um, business and areas that are not traditionally seen as ours with the tenure security side of things. So thank you, Clarissa. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Kate, and uh, thank you for that uh, final analysis of showing how, what tools are required in specific situations. That's exactly what we need. Now we're going to move to Charisse. Uh, she's got, got 20 minutes, Charisse. It's all yours. Oh, I don't have... I can't turn on my video, but... Um... Okay. Okay, let me see now. Yes. Mean. Right, do you all see my screen? Um, it's in presenter view at the moment. Oh. How about now? Perfect. Thank you, Cherise. Okay. okay, sorry about that. All right, so let me start. Um, I'll be talking about land tenure, land surveying, and climate change in Caribbean small island developing states. So I'll just speak briefly about the land characteristics in the Caribbean, the six land characteristics, and the impacts of climate change in the Caribbean and then talk a little bit about the land tenure regularization disaster management projects in SIDS. And finally about the geomatics response to climate change. So the land, of course, is islands are, are quite small, so you have that size issue. There's not a lot of land to allocate to the populations. And also that that will therefore impact on how we can provide for mitigation strategies. Um, I saw quite a bit of, of solar farms and wind farms in the previous two presentations. And we do have a couple of them that, that are sort of rudimentary, um, experimental, and then nowhere near that scale, of course. So that will uh, impact on what we can do for climate change. The population density as well, we have large, well, relatively um, dense populations in the Caribbean. And we're talking about in range 200 to 300, which may not be the most populous countries, but certainly there are less populous countries. You can compare, not with UK, it's probably on the same level, but in the US, it's probably about 35, 40 something to, um, as a comparison. So because of that, again, there's not much land to allocate to persons. Uh, land tenure is affected. And um, we have dependent economies, very restricted markets, small scale markets, as we saw uh, in the previous presentation from Kate. They had to look at niche markets like some boutique teas. Uh, we have to look at that type of things. We cannot compete in terms of volume and scale with larger markets because we have limited resources. And whatever happens to economies outside globally will impact on our economies. We import a lot of what we use. We also have vulnerability to natural hazards, which become exacerbated because of climate change. And that is impacted as well by the geography. And land and resource management, of course, there are conflicts over the limited land in terms of tenure and use the same land that is available and best for agriculture might be the same land that is available and the best for residential use. And the institutional capacities, we have small institutions, 
that have to manage land to perform land administration and they're limited in terms of their resources and lacking in capacity. While we at the university are uh, um, building capacity in land administration, land management, planning, et cetera, uh, we also see, and we have been doing that for quite a few years, we also see a brain drain of people who go to more opportunities in developed countries. So we still have to keep doing that. The geomorphology, as I mentioned, the uh, is limited land, and uh, many of the countries have this volcanic shape, which means slopes that will be um, more vulnerable to slipping and causing floods, and um, limited coastal areas where everybody can use. Uh, the slopes are usually occupied as still for residential for. Uh, agricultural purposes and that just makes the the flooding and the, the land slippage worse the history we have a, a shared history of colonization which has resulted in terms of land in a disparity in terms of land holding both in terms of size and um, the arable lands whether the capacity of the land to perform different agricultural purposes or other types of land use. And we have family land from the history and the, the lack of access to land. We have a lot of family land where people have passed on land through generations, but there's no security of tenure, no documentary security of tenure that says they, they own the land. And then we have spontaneous occupation. There's a lot of and informality, there's a lot of uh, state land and people occupy spontaneously and uh, um, informally. But there's also spontaneous occupation on private land as well, which is not, which needs to be regularized. So these things impact, as I said, uh, the climate change impacts would be flooding, landslides and these would continue and be uh, exacerbated by climate change. So we have to anticipate how we will deal with the tenure issues that this causes. And the species changes, the climate change also causes species changes. Uh, we see some sargassum seaweed. We've had a lot of that and that impacts as well on our ability to uh, use tourism as a form of income. But we also have invasive species, like other invasive species like lionfish, et cetera. So all those things impact on the ability to have livelihoods in the sea environment, the marine environment, and on land as well. The storm surges, those are getting worse with, climate, with sea level rise. And then hurricanes as well have been getting stronger. Um, although I see that they, they are moving a little northward, so maybe we won't be as impacted as badly. But you see here some pictures of, of actual impacts of um, land slippage, flooding, um, impacts on the, the infrastructure that needs to be recovered, especially in a limited economy. So some of the um, informal tenure regularization that have occurred and disaster management in the Caribbean. I'll look at, a little bit at the regularization using systematic adjudication and titling in St. Lucia and regularization using the social tenure domain model in St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, some, a pilot project that was done, and regularization using fit for purpose land administration in Trinidad and Tobago which is just a proposal and not being taken up really. And disaster management in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So in St. Lucia, there was systematic adjudication and titling done in the 80s. It was very successful. But some years afterwards, uh, we had to look at how that was done and whether the way it was done achieved the outcomes that were um, proposed at that time. They expected, they anticipated that 
the systematic adjudication and titling would result in a, a, a very vibrant land market, uh, use of credit, uh, opportunities to, to develop entrepreneurial activities, uh, commercial activities, but that did not happen um, in the way it was. It, it was predicted to the because of the availability, lack of of credit and credit institutions, the economy and the the and economic environment would restrict that from occurring at the end of the uh, as an outcome of systematic adjudication and titling. But you also have. Um, the lack of opportunities could also restrict the land market uh, if you only have certain things like uh, tourism to as an opportunity it would restrict the land activity in the land market and then lack of insurance even agricultural use if you don't have agricultural insurance with um, landslides and flooding impacting the agricultural sector you won't have the ability to recover but we can also see in terms of the appropriateness of land-related legislation, in many instances, the legislation is really imported from developed countries. Uh, but in this case, they actually titled a lot of people in terms in the name of the family. So family land groups were able to be titled, and this was very a very positive aspect. And appropriateness of land-related policies that also impacts on whether you get to uh, the growth and the land market. Of course, it costs and, and of titling registration and transaction registration would impact on the ability of the people who now are titled to register their inheritances and other transactions. And whether you do systematic or sporadic voluntary or compulsory titling can also impact on what the outcomes are. Other countries in the Caribbean, like Jamaica, have has been doing um, systematic, but it's been voluntary or compulsory, sometimes sporadic. So, and with varying degrees of outcomes, of positive outcomes or success, uh, Barbados as well, and um, Trinidad and Tobago is still to begin its its compulsory. Um, Titling. So some things are to, good to be learned from their process. The social tenant domain model was applied in St. Lucia and St. Vincent in a pilot project. And it was hoped that this, since the success of those pilot projects, that it would be scaled up to the country. But you have the risk of whether the society will accept the, the use of this social tenant domain model, uh, which is uh, uh, both a, a concept and a software to quickly um, record in situ where, what tenure people have without necessarily going to the rigid processes of compulsory titling. The, so the, the society has to accept it since it is a, a new process, it is less rigid, less technical. Um, they may feel it is not as good as the systematic adjudication and titling. Uh, the institutions have to accept it. And in speaking with the institutions, remember they are people, by people from the community themselves, communities themselves. And they look at it as accepting illegality where they have to now fund their own acquisition of land. There are people who have been um, occupying land and now getting their tenure recorded. So the institutions have to accept it if they are now going to be the ones to upscale it to the entire country. So we, have, we also have technical challenges and opportunities to pass on the build the capacity of the institutions and also the communities to scale up the project into the, the country. And that could, could be difficult. And resource requirements, if the state is going to have to manage the scaling up, they're going to look at what is the, the cost of um, scaling up this project.
disaster management. Uh, this was from uh, some research done in sentence 1920 Grenadines. And it was comp comparing the ability of different communities, ones that were had tenure security and ones that didn't have tenure security, to prepare, respond, and recover from disaster, which would be impacting um, even more with climate change. And of course, it was found that there was a disparity in the ability to prepare the using um, drainage and um, walls, retaining walls, et cetera, between the, the different communities to respond when the disaster hit and to recover after the, the disaster. Uh, lack of an ability to use the tenure to get access to credit to rebuild and to recover. So of course that, that happened. So we would need to identify climate change risks where they occur, whether it's locally in little communities or whether it's on a national scale, um, identify what would happen when there's this, um, this risk occurring, this hazard occurring, the, what will, will be lost, the loss of the knowledge. If it is not recorded, the persons who would probably die from the, the damage would lose, you would lose that, that information on who was occupying where, you have damaged the records and also complete loss of records. And that can happen at a limited scale and also on a national scale. So that needs to be managed. Um, we'd have to respond by going out now and recording that information, duplicating and archiving that information and making sure that knowledge is not lost in the event of a disaster. And we need to do that as climate change is exacerbating these hazards. And then we have to identify well, whose responsibilities are there. We need to support the individuals and the communities in being able to record their information, record their, their data on their tenure. And um, also in amongst the, the SIDS themselves, they can also look at providing that data supporting each other in um, storing that data, archiving that data. I know most people would say, well, we can store it on the cloud, but we've been having so many cyber attacks. Cyber security is a, a, a major issue, and we're talking about large-scale data in terms of the countries, if we're talking about land tenure for the entire country, and which, which will have to be very securely kept, securely managed. And well, lastly, the Fit for Purpose Land Administration um, proposal for Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we've had legislation for more than 20 years for the systematic adjudication and titling, but it has gone, the state has gone back and forth in what they would need to do with the, uh, the more than 300,000 individuals who are on state land, um, and there are also people on occupying private land. And while initially, initially the legislation accepted that these people could be titled since they had been in occupation for more 30, 40, even more years, um, the state keeps amending the legislation. And the last amendment said that the people, even though they were occupying state land for 30, 40 years, they would not be titled. It would be titled in the name of the state. So, even if you were to implement the adjudication and titling, um, now it would result in just the same number of people occupying state land without any, uh, any title. So again, you need to have, like in previous cases, societal acceptance of this less rigid documentation if you apply a fit for purpose land administration, which would mean that you are lowering the, the rigid expectations of documentation, of, of precision surveying. Um, and you also need to get the professionals on board. And speaking with my fellow surveyors, land surveyors, a lot of them don't accept that they need to lower their standards. They're accustomed to being very precise. And it's um, 
they don't want to, to lower their standards so it's fit for purpose land administration. So it's a lot of building awareness and showing them the, the benefits of at least having a comprehensive uh, survey and uh, comprehensive data instead of having very small scale but um, very complex and very rigid procedures. And well, there'll be technical challenges and opportunities uh, both for determining what is the minimum uh, requirements that we need to get to this comprehensive data and uh, what are the resource requirements and the costs. Uh, although those are things that we can probably um, attract the state with that it would be a touch lower cost, so much lower in cost than a rigid process. So what's the geomatics response to climate change? We need to be able to be, to be the ones to determine specifications for data quality and access, precision. There is, there is yes. a new sum up now. All right, so th th this is the last bit. I'll just sum up. These are some of the things that the land surveyors, the geomatics people are supposed to do, including making tenure and mapping a central component of national climate change strategies and plans, and even for the valuation surveyors, to integrate the land tenure rights and the value of these rights into any loss and damage discussion of where we are going with the climate change. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a, a, a real insight into all the aspects that have to be covered um, in a SIDS environment. Thank you very much for that. Now we're going into the time where when we've had a very rich set of uh, presentations to us on this uh, topic of, oh, sorry, I am supposed to be starting my video, sorry. I, uh, we, we've had a rich set of discussions and uh, on this topic of regionally relevant uh, uh, case studies of opportunities and gaps for surveying and climate. And now we're going into a time of, uh, 10 minute questions and answers by each speaker. And Simon, I'm handing over to you for Prof Chen. Thank you, Clarissa. Um, Professor Chen, uh, that was a very, uh, a very impressive um, uh, overview of what's what's happening with with what's going on in China, the the the, the, the climate impacts and 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 the responses. Um, the impacts are severe and the responses are, are very, um, very impressive as well. Um, I was wondering whether or not you could, um, I understand your focus is on landscape architecture and nature-based solutions. You were, you were talking about uh, carbon sequestration. Um, could you... Could you basically share with us some of the outstanding examples of how landscape architecture can contribute to mitigating the effects of climate change from your experience, please? Yeah, thank you. This is a very, very good question, actually. I, I my Actually, my background is geography. Later, I think, you know, we did a lot of analysis. We did a lot of spatial mapping, but how can we help the design of a landscape, you know, to address the climate change. So later I changed my career, you know, from uh, uh, totally, you know, the knowledge production, the, 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 the mapping, you know, to the design process. Mm -hmm. So I think this is, I think, you know, the landscape can make a very big contribution to the uh, climate change, you know, address the climate change, especially, you know, the, I think a, a lot of you understand what is landscape architecture. In the landscape in uh, in our department, we always say landscape architecture is a design of outdoor areas. You know that include the communities and also the parks. You know the uh, these kind of uh, areas. You know in the cities and also in the rural areas. So you know uh, when we think about the outside outdoor areas, you know especially in the urban areas, you know, you, you can think about the communities, the, the um, parks, and also the rivers, you know, the, the lakes and uh, 
uh, uh, wetland and all these areas that, that is our expertise we are trying to you know to um, help to create these kind of healthy safe and beautiful places you know for for the for for people and also for biodiversity for wildlife yeah so um, i think uh, uh uh, you know, nowadays, a lot of my uh, colleagues, you know, we are trying to design like uh, parks, you know, with special materials, you know, how we, uh, we are trying to see, you know, what kind of materials can you can uh, use less uh you know you use less materials but also can uh can reduce the carbon you know this is why kind of a uh, race you know also you know use these kind of materials we can help the water to filtrate you know to to go down the uh, the street you know now like nowadays we use a lot of uh, uh concrete or like uh improve impress uh um, surface, you know, the water can can't go down the soil below. So I think this is what we did, and also, you know, we are trying to um, develop the the rivers, you know, the water bodies, and also the like wetland, the road. We are the especially, you know, in the coastal areas, we are trying to develop this area, the, these kind of landscapes, and try to. Uh, you know, to adapt to the climate change, not only nowadays, but also in, like in 20 or 40, uh, you know, in, in end of this century. So this is, you know, what is the, like uh, the uh, geography analysis and the landscape architecture can work together, especially, you know, for the uh, geo uh, geography and hydrology analysis can help us understand what is the, uh, what is the uh, climate change we what climate change will affect you know what kind of, how, how much like what depths will be in like uh, 2015 or 2100 mm -hmm. so then if we understand you know at that time how much sea level will rise how much water we can get out of the land then we can plan you know what kind of our uh, landscape we can help to address these kind of flood issues also yeah as i told you know when we in the parks in the we are trying to use different kind of our species you know the flowers they can not only make the uh, environment very beautiful but also you know they can absorb more uh, more carbon, you know, and store more carbon in the park area. So this is mm. what we found, you know, in the ar landscape architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a question from Cromwell um, saying that um, there has been uh, some interest in uh, a shift in interest in the life cycle analysis of materials. Um, sorry. Um especially on renewable energy components. How do you think such proper waste disposal of uh, components would impact future climate scenarios? So in other words, what we're looking at is the whole life cycle from, from the construction, but also the disposal and, and uh, with any luck, recycle rather than total just um, disposal. Hello, Professor Chen. Could can can you hear me? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I think <laughs> you you ask the next question. You know, so uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I was going to ask another question of you. Um, in in the chat, um, Cromwell has has asked, um, ha has made a comment. Um, there has also been some shift of interest on life cycle analysis of materials, especially in renewable energy components. How do yeah. you think such proper waste disposal of uh, components would impact future climate scenarios? Uh, yeah, this is a very good question, but I haven't done the quantitative quantitative analysis. But we did a lot of you know qualitative analysis, especially you know as you talk about the clean energies. You know now I think a lot of countries already think about you know. 
um, because of like 20 years of development of solar panels, wind yeah. power, and also, you know, a lot of uh, electrical vehicles. Nowadays, we have a lot of, uh, you know, gradually, we may have more and more, uh, uh, you know, raised from uh, from this uh, development. Now, especially, you know, uh, last year, we did a lot of uh, uh, survey, you know, in some places, they already have like uh, 15 years of uh, solar panels, even you know that still can be used twenty, uh, still can be used like uh, ten years, twenty years. But uh, the technology that time is not like uh, the the technology mm -hmm. nowadays. Nowadays the efficiency is more high, so they try to re you know replace these kind of um, uh, you know the solar panels and wind powers, and then you know they they produce a lot of uh, uh, waste. But the problem, you know, the waste, most of nowadays, the solar panels, most of the time, people try to, you know, the, the companies try to just you know, bury in the ground. So that actually is not so good. So nowadays, a lot of com a lot of companies in China, they try to, you know, to uh, separate these kind of materials and get, you know, to, to for, for the recycling use. And also, we, we last year, we went to a company in, uh, in Zhejiang, in, of China, you know, they are trying to uh, collect all the uh, electric vehicles, and they try to get the uh, battery materials, and they recycle that. I think gradually, there is a, this is a very, very big business. And, uh, if we uh, erased now and uh, you know several years later we can we can recycle all of these materials and we don't need to you know get more uh, more minerals from Africa from other countries that will be have a very big impact. So I think yes. yeah the, the recycle business is uh, is very important. Good, good. Um, I ha I have one more question, or maybe I have more than one, but I have another question. Oh, one more. I've been told one more minute. Maybe I haven't got time for the question. So maybe I will now transfer back to Clarissa, um, who will ask the next question. Then we, I've got other questions in the general plenary I would like to talk with you, if that's okay. Thank you, Thank you very much for that, Simon and Prof Chen. So now I'm handing over to Roshni, who will facilitate questions for uh, Kate Fairley. Hi, Kate. Um, I just want to say how really insightful it was to hear from you about the work you've been doing, the great um, variety of projects you've been doing, and the impact that you're having across so many different countries. Um, I guess to start off with, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about the fact that we, we know that working on land and climate projects does present unique challenges. So could you please share some of the challenges that you have faced in implementing these case studies and any valuable lessons that can be drawn from your experiences? I can give it a go. Thank you for being such an awesome hype woman, Roshni. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone in the comments. Um, yeah, really great to have so much interest in this. And it's really, really great that the FIG is starting to, to move on climate change. I'm really excited by that. Um, yeah, land and climate projects are hard. <laughs> um, some of the challenges that I can talk about, um, something that really plays on our mind a lot is the, the short-term project, project time frames. Um, so we often work with um, development partners, international donors, so the World Bank, um, UN, um, government agencies like UK aid or Australian aid, and they have finite windows. So the maximum time frame for a project is often five years. But no country can do a land reform in five years and climate change can certainly not be addressed in five years. So ensuring that sustainability within the project is difficult. Similarly, projects are silos. Um, we all love good silo. And whilst we're doing it like in Nauru, for example, there's a revolving door of consultants. Um, we're in Nauru working on, on land tenure and master planning, but there are other consultants working on water and sanitation or implementing solar. Um, and we don't necessarily know who they are, but we're all, we're all interconnected. Um, so we're all kind of working in these silos and it's really hard to, um, yeah, get that conversation going across. You have to put a lot of effort into it. And I don't really see that um, 
development partners are helping that much. Um, country governments aren't able to help that much from a capacity side as much as their own silos. Um, and, you know, literally my colleague was at the beach doing her exercise here in Wollongong and found someone else working in that route. Like, and that's how we discovered this. So yeah, getting those knowledge um, uh, transfers is really important. Um, and I think that's, that's, pretty tricky. Um, and I guess the final point is just that climate change and land are both really wicked, complex problems. So um, it's just, it's hard, but it requires a lot of com communication and those sort of longer timeframes and longer visions. It's interesting you mentioned complexity. Um, in a little while, I will be presenting um, a, yes. a model of leading in complexity, um, which I hope also brings insights and help us think about how we can do this better because it is going to become a lot more common and it is of course already quite urgent but it's going to become a lot more um, prevalent as well. So the next thing that I was hoping to ask you is um, you know given your focus on sustainable development and uh, you know the case studies that you presented how do you think these initiatives are contributing to learning and sharing lessons across the probably across the Asia Pacific region, maybe even globally, um, especially in terms of climate resilience and equity and land management. All right, I don't know that I'm gonna answer this very well, but I'm gonna put a few thought bubbles out and hopefully others can expand on this. Um, in terms of knowledge sharing, this has been playing on our minds a lot because like, again, just to go back to the silos, we operate our projects and it can be hard to sort of factor in the ability to share knowledge between the projects. Um, we've been trying to instigate something between um, the Indonesia work we've been doing and the Mekong. Um, but some of the challenges we've gone into, for example, um, we looked at IC spatial planning in Indonesia um, as really fundamental, like a nice way into tenure security without having to do land titling. Um, and, you know, all the, the problems that can sometimes come with land titling, particularly linking with Indigenous peoples. Um, so we thought spatial planning might be a nice entry point for Laos, for example, that also has a number of Indigenous peoples who need their rights to forest recognised. Um, but the different framework, legal frameworks between those countries can create a bit of a barrier to that. Um, having said that, both countries are sort of looking at red plus projects, um, reducing deforestation. So sometimes the, the challenges, it's the nice way, and then we've got to remove some of the labels for spatial planning. Um, so we're starting those conversations and I think that continuous knowledge sharing is really important. I think the, I did want to put a point around the, the equity side of things. Um, again, I think surveyors work in this really nice intersection of, of working across a range of issues, but we're maybe learning ourselves around the, the social safeguards thing that I mentioned, um, gender, um, addressing people's rights. And we're really good at technical information. Um, technical information is easy, let me repeat that. Um, but the social is really hard. And I think we're, we're getting there. And, you know, again, sort of some of the stuff that FIG is doing with Fit for Purpose is really great. Um, Stand for Her Land's another great initiative to sort of call out and FIG sort of partnered there. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot to do in terms of um, recognizing different people's perspectives, understanding the power dynamics. Um, again, we're doing a lot of in the political economy space. We're seeing that as really important because land is fundamentally values-based. So it's not just about putting in boundaries. It's about understanding what are people's relationships to land? How can that be reflected, you know, that practice be reflected in laws? Um, and what are the different power dynamics that are in play? Um, recognizing those so that you can, you know, we we often work with both government at the top level, but also communities at the bottom. So how can we play that um, knowledge broker role between those two and help to sort of come to a space where, you know, we're comfortable that it's equitable um, or as equitable as it's going to get, I guess. Um, so I don't know, I've answered it, but I think sort of um, recognizing the power dynamics and the political economy element is a, a really important role for surveyors to play moving forward. That was a really um, quite a good answer to a very complex <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> one, um, one thing that I'm interested in is um, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that a lot of the work that's happening in this space um, often includes people with a very Western uh, worldview going in to help communities that may have more of a Indigenous or First Nations worldview that may have quite different values. What are some tips or um, prompts 
you might be able to give anyone who might be working in this space or interested in working in this space about how to overcome that divide and not unintentionally, unconsciously impose your Western worldviews onto the work that you're doing that involves various worldviews. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really great question. And, you know, I'm certain in all instances, I'm bringing my own worldview and trying to be aware of it, but probably um, implementing it. Um, I think the, there's one word to the answer, which is listen. Um, and that sort of comes up a lot of in the Indigenous conversations in Australia. Um, but you have to approach this, you know, from a listening perspective, um, that you're not an expert coming in to solve a problem. You're, you know, you, you do have expertise, you're bringing that in to share it. Um, but you're not solving the problem. You're giving other people the information so that they can solve the problem. Um, and you just sort of have to help with some of the tools, some of the frames, uh, framings, and then let it go. I mean, this is a challenge for me in particular because I like to move fast. I like to have answers. Um, I like to solve problems. I'm an engineer. Um, so sometimes things can move a lot more slowly than I'm comfortable with. Um, and then it's approaching it from different ways. So um, something, again, we've been doing in Nauru is, you know, initially we did these beautiful reports around, you know, this is sort of the land tenure situation and, you know, you're really proud of sort of this nice academic report, but it's very hard for other people to interpret on the other side. So we're looking at different ways to communicate information. Um, there's a real, there's some really interesting initiatives um, in I've seen in the Pacific and Solomon Islands, for example, where people are using comic books to communicate information um, in Africa. I know there's sort of talking book sort of examples, like there's lots of different ways to communicate information. Um, so yeah, I can say listen to start off with, but then sort of add that with, you know, understand how you're presenting information and try to tailor that to your audience so that they're receiving it and not just also doing something with it, not just accepting it as expertise, um, but able to embed their knowledge within that. Thank you very much. I will now pass over to Cromwell, who is joining us from Italy and will be um, facilitating the questions for our speaker, uh, Carice. Well, thank you, Roshni. Well, Dr. Charles, so here we are. I was listening to your presentation it, and I think um, your work on, with land uh, uh, informal settlements regularization is a very important and of very uh, great relevance nowadays. So what do you think are the main roles of geomatics engineering or surveyors in this process of regularization of uh, informal land settlements? Well, uh, the role of the land surveyors, while the technical aspect of it is to measure the occupation of people, they also have to be the one to determine, well, how rigid do we have to be? What is the precision we need? And they need to sort of listen to the people. And uh, cadastral surveyors are accustomed to doing this. They're accustomed to um, speaking to people and trying to, it's not necessarily uh, a precise positioning problem. Mm -hmm. You, it's really to find out where people think that they, they occupy and um, to get together two landowners who share a boundary to come to some agreement about where they occupy and what they um what they what tenure they have. Right. And How that is, about goals, but um well, I was just going on to climate change and how that <laughs> impacts on it. Not really, um, yeah. That's my follow-up question, honestly. So how about uh, with, uh, in terms of um, disaster management in risk mitigation of informal settlements, what roles do, do we have there in a, with your experience, of course, in the small islands? Mm -hmm. What roles can we occupy as land surveyors? Yes, well, we need to position in that instance, uh, both in horizontal and vertical positioning. But I think we really need to interact in, in some um, multidisciplinary teams because there's a lot about climate change we don't know. So while we may say, okay, we're measuring to this precision, um, somebody who is more involved in climate change will say, well, what is the, the result of the climate change? What kind of um, uh, differences uh, are we looking for? So we need to be in that kind of multidisciplinary space, but provide our own expertise to it. Right, of course. Well, um, 
I saw that you uh, you used STDM, both STDM and fit for purpose land administration on in your studies. Okay. So I was thinking, uh, in based on your experiences, what kind, what are the best practices that you were able to observe while applying these uh, two techniques, these two models, and how do you think um, these techniques could be replicated in other areas of the world, like for example in the Southeast Asia or maybe some um parts of Europe as well? Well, um, I have to say, like Kate, the technical aspect of it is is easy to apply. You go out and you measure, but then we are getting that kind of, of feedback, that kind of um, um, acceptance of both the, the people in the communities and also the state institutions is the difficult aspect of it. And we're accustomed to just saying, okay, this is it. This is what you have. This is the mapping that we've done. But we really need to be, um, you know, speaking and listening and trying to see where the where the resistance is, right. and that could be, that could be the difficult part of it. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so, so. In fact, um, um uh, my personal question is: while listening to your uh, presentation, uh, like Kate was saying about how about gender roles on my side was, uh, did you involve um citizen mapping volunteer uh, volunteers in on in applying STDM on your uh, in special planning in risk matter mitigation, or do you uh did you hire mainly um skilled volunteers in studying this area? What's your thoughts on on part participatory mapping, for example? Okay, well we uh well we worked alongside of the people in the community and tried to build their capacity to do it on their own. So we'd be out there with the SDM with the software with um with the tablets and try to build their capacity while showing them how to do it. And that probably that's the way, the best way to do it. And um, to hope that it could be replicated when we leave. But um, again, as, as was said before, the project is only the, has the lifespan of when the project is, is being applied, but when the project is being implemented. As soon as you leave, Everyone goes back to their, their old duties and they say, well, we don't have the resources to continue this. We don't have the wherewithal to continue this. We have other work to do. We've already pulled them out because in implementing it and trying to get the um the feedback and trying to get the people on board, uh, we were already pulling them out from their day-to-day -day duties. So they were probably just as soon as we left, just give the sigh of relief that so at least they're gone. Now I can get back to my, my work, my day job. So it, it's wow. very difficult. I've, no, I've, I've known it from both sides because in projects that I implemented in Trinidad, I've been in within an institution, a land administration institution, and I've seen the project come in and then we have to go back to our own job. And everything just sits there for another year, for a few years until another project comes in. Oh, uh, what you're saying is that we have the same problem in all parts of the world, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. We're trying to, you know, promote something and, you know, the the area we are working with just tend to go back to the previous ways of living, despite mm -hmm. handing them some, you know, key uh, tools to uh, move forward and, you know, resolve uh, what, like Kate was saying, to, you know, provide some help, some tools. Mm -hmm. Yes, to, to, yes. Yeah, so. On the other yes. hand, as part of the academia from Dr. Charles, what do you think is the main role of education and training in um, this kind of um projects? Well, uh, from our role in the department, uh, we're building capacity all the time. We're building capacity and we're just sending them out. They go in and we've, we've trained people from the region. They go into the institutions and this is the best way that we can um, build from within. Uh, when they go into the institutions, they already have the, the knowledge and then they can play that role of, of training the trainers, you know, um, and putting it out to other people. That's the only way that we can, you know, 
really get our tentacles into the problems. Huh. Interesting. Um, this says that. Um, do you think? Um, even in uh, um, for from a younger age, do you think um, you can start uh, giving young people the idea of working towards climate change, like from from high school, from elementary school, and not just from un university. What do you think? Um. Like we we have the uh, in the young surveyors network we have the get kids into surveying programs partner partners with uh, with 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 uh, with FIG. How do you think that would be applied? I guess in the small uh, in small islands. Uh well we yeah we we're building it into our programs. We have to build in all these things necessarily into geomatics programs, climate change, and diversity, and all of the global issues and global thinking into our programs. Um, certainly if it's done from a lower level, it is it will inculcate in them from a much earlier level. But we try to do that at the tertiary level to inculcate those ideas into whatever they're doing. So that should help. That's very, 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 very interesting to, to learn. So, right. Um, don't see any other questions from um from our um friends online. So I guess I'm going to hand back to Roshni the uh for the next session. No, I'll I'll pick up from here and All right. for the moment. Thanks very much, uh, Cromwell. So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask Simon. Uh, and, and then Roshni and then Cromwell to just give us a couple of minutes, uh, uh, not more than five minutes, a summary of what they heard from the speaker and their sessions. Thank you. Simon, over to you. Thank you. Just unmute. Um, uh, Pro uh, Professor Chen's uh, presentation was, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, really giving a bit of an overview, uh, discussing the climate impacts um, that affect China and, and, and her response to those, uh, those impacts, um, mitigation and adaptation. Um, the problems, uh, as, as Professor Chen discussed, is that uh, temperatures haven't been increasing steadily um, in China since the 1900s. Uh, 40 degrees Celsius temperatures are now commonplace in, in her cities. Um, extreme rainfall, flooding, um, the increased risk from cyclones in the coastal zone are all impacting um, sea level rise. Um, there was some a couple of alarming uh, slides there showing the two degrees and four degrees um, warming in, um, increase. Uh, on on uh, the flooding impacts in Shanghai. Um, basically, parts of the city would have to be abandoned, I would imagine, although that wasn't necessarily discussed. But yeah, it, it just shows that that with in those sort of ranges, um, it's going to be it's it's the coastal zone is going to be very very greatly changed. Um, but but also um, the other issue is is increasing drought, which is seems a little bit counterintuitive, but there it is. Um, China is the world's largest carbon emitter, although emissions are relatively, the, the actual carbon emissions are relatively low by international standards. Um, it, the carbon emissions will peak by 2030, um, and with, with the um, solutions in place, uh, it is expected that carbon neutrality will be reached by 2060. Um, and, and as Professor Chen was saying, China's response is already seeing uh, reductions. Um, uh, this has led, in, there's, there's many prongs to, to, the, to the response, the mitigation and, and the um, uh, adaptation. Uh, there's been a huge investment in renewable energy. Um, China basically result, contributes to 75% of the solar PV capacity in the world uh, is comes from China and there's huge investments in wind farm in, in wind and, and, and other renewables 50% of the EVs uh, worldwide are manufactured in China 
4 million of them were, were, were produced in uh, 2023. So 10% of China's carbon is now being sequestered. Um, sponge cities, ecosystem restoration and national parks. Um, carbon trading is also is increasingly successful. Uh, method of uh, helping to reduce emissions. Um, uh, there's also been a lot of infrastructure that has to be built. High voltage transmission lines are bringing the solar power that's generated in the north of the country to where it's needed in the south. Um, and the other thing that I found quite interesting was the National Disaster Risk Survey. Uh, every 10 years will, will be taken every 10 years to understand the effects of climate change on on um, on people on the environment and habitats. So that's pretty much what I, uh, what I picked up from, from this discussion. And there's obviously more things that we will talk about in the plenary session based on that. Um, thank you, Simon. And I'm just handing over to Roshni now for her summary on Kate. Thank you very much, Clarissa. And thank you again, Kate. So Kate um, spoke with us about a series of case studies into land and climate within the international development context. Um, she started off speaking about Nauru, where she focused on tenure reform. There were complications within the case study around urbanization, sea level rise, tidal inundation, and resource dependence. Um, we learnt that about 80% of the island was mined for phosphate. That means that the interior is now really quite barren and un un uninhabitable. And that um, is a really great sort of microcosm for what we might see in the future for areas of um, various societies that exist today, potentially becoming uninhabitable as a result of climate change impacts. Um, we learnt about how there is unsustainable economic dependence on phosphate fishing rights and the, there's a lot of different um, climate change impacts around sea level rise, tidal inundation, storms and water security. Um, and the complexities sort of really came to into play when we started to learn about how they're developing the Nauru Higher Ground Initiative. Um, some of the key takeaways that I took from this case study was around, you know, how do we understand the way that customary land ownership practices can continue to be able to protect and restore enable Nauru's future. We need to understand the different worldviews at play. We need to understand, um, I guess, how we can create incentives that will facilitate conservation in a way that is sustainable over time. Um, then, uh, you know, uh, Kate was going to speak about the Papua um, case study where it was interesting to understand that spatial planning really is a unique tool that can be used. There are many complexities, but as she made a point of highlighting, the technical is easy, but the social is hard. And that perhaps is a really unique um, but very applicable insight into a lot of the work that we do as surveyors across the world, where we are very good at the technical side of things. We're great at understanding the limitations of the data, how accurate it is, how it can be used, um, but understanding the social elements involved will be something that becomes a lot more important as we start to be more active um, participants in creating change for sustainability. I also wanted to mention around um, some of the things that Kate has highlighted around through, sorry, not around, but through her case studies is that part of the role that we play as surveyors and engineers is to bridge the gap between different cultures and using land as the medium for this. We're all quite familiar with the importance of this. However, I think that it's useful for us to think about how this might shift moving forward, particularly in the context of rapid changes as a result of climate. As we move forward, um, linking into some of the information that Professor Chen provided in his presentation, there will be parts of cities that are currently very um, densely populated that will become uninhabitable. Um, 
linking with the Nauru example that Kate provided, how can we think forward and use our tools within the social context? Um, it's really useful for us to consider how we can become more skilled uh, in the areas that are more uncomfortable for us, how we can become better skilled with the social. Thank you very much. I'll pass over to Cromwell. Uh, thanks, Roshni. Um, Cromwell, you got 10 minutes uh, to do uh, uh, Charisse. Thank you. Right. Hey, and thank you, Clarissa. Well, Dr. Charisse Charles talked uh, talk about um, her work uh, within the small islands development, developing states or in the Caribbean, of course, starting from what differs uh, the, uh, the, the Caribbean, the, the small uh, SITS, for example, in terms of size, population density, its vulnerability and climate change and natural hazards and disasters. She also talked about um, um, SIDSS, geomorphology, history, societal uh, importance in family land use and in for, uh, informal land settlements that's happening uh, within the within this, this, those islands. Moreover, she talked about um, what are the catastrophe, the natural disasters, natural disasters that they usually happen uh, in those areas, such as flooding, landslides, soil erosions, storm surges, and hurricanes. And she also um, illustrated some um, systems that uh, they use both in uh, St. Lucia and St. Vincent, and also in Trinidad and Tobago. In particular, in St. Lucia and um, St. Vincent, the social tenure domain model was used for for land titling for land titling of informal settlements, while in Trinidad and Tobago, a fit for purpose land administration approach was uh, used. During our Q and A, our discussions, she highlighted the importance of building the capacity both from um, lower level up to the higher levels and across the society. So it's a vertical and horizontal approach in both ways. Like um, Kate was saying, the technical part was easier, but the societal part is, the, tends to become uh, a harder way to uh, approach, uh, a harder way to uh, resolve uh, within, the, within the small islands. Also, um, she reminded us that us surveyors can work in the, in various uh in various uh ways when it comes to uh risk management for informal settlements such as in cadastral and cadastral and we surveyors we work in precisions in and in accuracy so we we need to um, maintain our focus on that uh expertise of ours also we need also to uh, start to think globally, starting from uh, the ground up. So it's not just globally from the bigger picture, but from the smallest part of the society to, to the bigger uh, scen scenario. Also, uh, um, she rose, uh, she talked about the problem like, uh, in most cases, despite uh, giving the tools needed to uh, resolve issues in the informal land settlements, people tend to go back to their previous ways, unfortunately. And we need to uh, also think maybe in the future how to resolve such kind of response from, um, from the community. It's very important also to uh, start listening to the people who are, who are on the... Uh, on, on site and not just uh, move forward with the technical stuff. So we need to work hand in hand with the people off the ground, of, uh, of the community. Well, I think I covered pretty much everything from Dr. Char Charis, which was very, very interesting. I really hope that we can replicate some of those uh, techniques, some, some of those models in different parts of Asia Pacific. 
Thank you very much, Cromwell. Um, and now we will have a look at some of the graphics of what we've been talking about. Uh, these are some of the kind of graphic tools maybe that people have referred to earlier, which make it sensible. So Dana, over to you. <coughs> Are you with us, Dana? Yes, she's um, just getting herself organized. Apologies, I was talking on mute, uh, a classic one. Um, I just was saying uh, thank you for having me along. Good day. I'm Dana. I am your graphic recorder, so I've been visually note taking some of the key points from all the presentations. Um, I'll just do a quick fly around because we have just um, heard a great summary. But from um, the start of the session, Clarice opened up with a great introduction into the United Nations um, and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the 1972 Earth Summit. And really from this, it kind of came out that we must address the interconnected challenges of the human impact on climate. Um, and identifying that surveyors are, are a role that are so connected um, to a lot of the work needed to address climate change. Um, I'm now just sort of still working on some of the, uh, the, the presentation visuals um, and I will continue to progress these, but some of the highlights here, again, at a high level from um, Rishan is, uh, you know, the China, is acknowledging they're their large carbon emission in their role there, but has done a great effort in mitigating through their dual carbon goals um, towards carbon neutrality by 2060. Um, you know, we, we saw some impressive images of solar panel fields across mountains and so um, deserts. Uh, back over towards the Asia Pacific from Kate Farley. Again, we heard several case studies in detail about um, uh, Nauru and Papua New Guinea, just to uh, mention a few focusing on um, interventions through tenure land, uh, tenure reform, as well as um, promoting land principles through complex partnerships in the Papua Guinea uh, um, case study there. And then finally, our land tenure in the Caribbean by Caricia um, gave us a great introduction to uh, the characteristics of the Caribbean islands being small with slopes um, and a, you know, a distinct sort of context around colonial history, family land, um, and spontaneous and informal use of occupation land, and how um, over in the Caribbean, uh, they've been moving from a systemic a systemic um, education and titling sort of system and trying to push more into a social tenure domain. Um, and, you know, each of these spaces come with impacts and challenges that must be addressed. Um, but again, that role of surveyors coming into multidisciplinary dis discipline teams um, and working across vertical and horizontal spaces and scopes. Um, so thank you so much. I will continue to work in the background here um, and let you guys continue your rich discussions. Thanks very much, Dana. And now we pass over to Roshni, uh, who's going to introduce us to the Kenefin framework. Thank you, Roshni, 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be presenting to you today the Kenefin uh, framework, which is a model for leading and working in complexity. When you look at this, don't be overwhelmed. I know it's a lot, but we'll work through this um, quite slowly and I will explain to you what it means for surveyors after we've done that. So we'll start off with the bottom right hand corner, moving up to the top right hand corner, across to the top left hand corner, and then down to the bottom left hand corner. I'd like to start off with the first quadrant, the clear quadrant in the bottom right hand side. As we move across all of these quadrants, there will be a, an increase in um, complexity and a shift from the way we manage information and how we know information, which has implications for what we do with that information, what it means for the way we do projects and the way we use our skills as surveyors. You'll notice that across the middle, there is a horizontal da dot dashed line. And on the right-hand side of that, there is known, predictable, and fact-based. 
And on the left hand side, there is unknown, unpredictable and pattern based. When we look at the bottom right hand corner, the clear quadrant, this is the domain of best practice. So I want you to think about taking a, you know, your total station out into the field or doing a laser scan. As surveyors, when we do this, we understand exactly what we're doing, exactly what we're going to get. There is a clear relationship between cause and effect. I collect data, I understand what the limitations of that data set are, I understand clearly whether it's complete or not, I understand I have the metadata. It's, um, it's a space where we are able to achieve best practice because we're really able to replicate what has been done before. However, not all situations are like this. As we move into the top right hand corner, we move into the complicated quadrant. This is the domain of experts, and this is the domain that a lot of us spend most of our time working in. Here, we require some level of analysis or other form of investigation to apply our expert knowledge and achieve results. Think of launching a rocket into space. When we do this, it will be different each time. Unlike in the first quadrant, we won't just be able to press a button and achieve the same results. We won't be able to just replicate what we do. We will need to customize it each time. When we are in this um, quadrant, when we're working in this quadrant, we're able to put our knowledge to good use. However, there will be times where we will need to understand that things don't work in the complicated quadrant, in which case we move one step to the right, to the top uh, left, sorry, to the left, to the top left hand quadrant, the complex quadrant. Here, think of planning for and responding to natural disasters. Think of all of the impacts of climate change. All of the presentations that we have heard today from uh, Professor Chen, from Kate, from Sharice, they all encapsulate how surveyors are working in the complex quadrant. This is the domain of experiments. There really can only be uh, information understood in retrospect to be able to understand what the details were, what the factors were. You see, we've really shifted from the known to the unknown, from the predictable to the unpredictable, and from the fact-based to the pattern-based. This is the domain of emergent practice. We, we develop new knowledge that allows us to see how the world has shifted and changed, and we're able to then use that knowledge to think about what could be happening in the future, acknowledging that it too will be different. However, sometimes there are situations where we experience uh, chaos. Think of the COVID-19 pandemic or think of being in the midst of a natural disaster happening right now, something unprecedented um, like a tsunami, a flood, raging wildfires. Within the chaotic quadrant, it is the domain of rapid response. There will be a very um, rare chance that you'll have a complete data set or a current data set. It's likely that you'll have to make do with information that you learn on the go and you'll need to make decisions on the fly with what you have. Sometimes as surveyors, we are called to operate in this quadrant as well. So Simon, who's on the call right now, um, definitely operated in this space during the um, earthquakes and floods that happened in New Zealand a couple of years ago. So I'm going to now explain what this means in terms of how we work. When we're in the clear quadrant, it's really, it's really clear and simple how we work, how we can achieve success, how we can manage risk, how, what tools we can use to make our life easier. So we can understand our goals and timelines, we can use 
um, task lists, we can plan things using, um, you know, Prince2 project management, Gantt charts. It's uh, very easily re replicable. When we are in the complicated quadrant, however, some of these tools uh, from the clear quadrant are no longer quite as useful. We may need to lean into more agile project management. The function of teams will require less hierarchy and we might need to stream, streamline our tools and processes to be able to capture the key trends that happen um, in terms of risk, in terms of the way forward, in terms of planning, but they will need to be customized to some degree. As we move to the complex quadrant, we move to an even more strategic way of working. The goal and the pathway are often constantly evolving. Um, we really need to be flexible and leadership, importantly, within this complex quadrant is no longer about leading from the top. It's about facilitating from the bottom to remove obstacles and helping your team to balance each team member's strengths and weaknesses to become a united whole that is able to tackle the goal. When we happen to be in a state of the chaotic quadrant, all of the old rules will go out the window. We need to keep abreast of the latest developments and the changing situation and make the best decisions we can on the fly with the information that we have. And at this point, strategy is emergent and we, we, we need to go with some level of instinct and experience because planning is usually impossible. So what does this mean for surveyors working on climate? As you've heard from some of our speakers today, earth system science and climate science are moving at a really exponential rate in multiple directions, both in theory and practice. Given that we all have most okay we may not all have full-time jobs but all of us are working really hard and we have a lot of things taking up our time we are not climate scientists but that's okay we also know that the frequency and variability of climatic events is increasing rapidly over time and climatic events are reaching many more places much more often so we're moving to problem solving that is um, pattern-based rather than fact-based as we realize that our historical climate record becomes less and less relevant to the future state requiring emergent practice and novel practice. So this means that for us as surveyors we know that we are most comfortable when dealing with familiar uh, levels of detail, we want to understand certainty, quantification, but we must get comfortable in zooming out to a systems level and dealing with uncertainty and emergence in our work. We must also learn to understand systems thinking and take a systems approach to creating our solutions. Importantly, we must embrace technological solutions to help us deal with the scales of data that will be required to combat the problems that we are working on, which are also scaling up. And we must not feel that we need to create all of the solutions ourselves. We as a sector, as an industry, are both generalists and specialists. However, it's more imperative now than ever before that we lean on other industries and sectors to help create the solutions that we need for the planet and that we also allow ourselves to offer our skills, our knowledge to other disciplines to come together to create solutions together because ultimately we are stronger together. Thank you. I'll now hand back to Clarissa. Thank you for that, Roshni, and stimulating us and uh, challenging us to uh, think in new ways. And now I'm going to hand over to you, Roshni, to facilitate for the, the rest of this seminar time. Thank you. Thank you. So this, I think, is actually one of the most exciting parts of today's um, event. We have been uh, educated, inspired by this suite of international experts. They have shared their knowledge with us. They've prompted us to think about what some of the um, important issues are that we need to think about, what the areas of knowledge are 
opportunities and gaps where they might exist in terms of how we can work on climate together. And this is at different scales. Some of us are working at very local levels within a particular community. Some of us are working at international levels, um, trying to solve very complex global problems. So, I would now like to open up uh, with a couple of questions to some of our speakers. And I thoroughly encourage anyone who is in our audience today to, if you would like to speak at any time, to offer your ideas, to ask a question, please uh, use the, the raise hand function and we will be able to invite you to unmute and ask your questions of the speakers. So um, to start off with, I'd like to ask a question to um, Kate. Kate, what do you think are the key issues that could make the design of surveying systems more affordable for developing countries in the global south? Oh, I knew you were going to start with me. Um... I think it's not really about the design of technologies. I think it's standards and legal frameworks. Um, I think it might have been Therese who referred to this in her presentation, um, but a lot of countries in the developing world um, are, you know, adopting either because of colonisation or because they're emulating um, Western societies, you know, quite um, high standard levels of um, high standards um, that aren't required, like they're not fit for purpose. And we've sort of pushed this in FIG having fit for purpose standards. Um, and then also understanding how law impacts practice um, and what sort of maybe, you know, per perverse incentives might have. But I mean, when you come down to it, when you live in a house and your neighbour lives in a house, you both pretty much know where your boundary is unless there's sort of some other con conflict there. So I don't think as surveyors we should put, be putting overt levels of standards on that and, you know, identify what's fit for purpose. And that's really how we can reduce the cost um, of technology moving through. I think looking at cloud systems in terms of IT is a little bit more tricky um, because there's sort of issues around paper management and when and how you should implement those cloud systems. But there's a lot of people working in this space and there's some really good solutions. So I'd say the issue is less with low cost technology. I think there's a lot of low cost technology out there that's accessible. Um, but it's more with the standards, the frameworks, the, the laws um, in play. Following on from that, there's a great question that Mel Saberi um, put into the chat um, a, a, a little earlier. Um, Professor Chen, I wonder if you might be able to uh, respond to her. So she's asked, can we tap into big data and generative AI analysis of big data? specifically qualitative data like local and social impacts, pain points, concerns, suggestions, etc. She's mentioned that the finance industry pioneers have been doing this partly for many, for many developed and developing countries. <clears throat> yeah, this is a great question actually. Nowadays, a lot of people use big data and generative AI analysis. You know, um, I think is there's uh, you know for the big data, especially we already use a lot in the uh, environmental you know in the environmental also the flooding and uh, disaster risk management. You know for for example, you know we get a lot of we can get a lot of uh, data from Twitter after one disaster. You know like uh, after flood or after after fire. Uh, wildfire uh, to see how you know to see how many people how, how many you know um, Twitter uh, people you know response on the on the Twitter and we get this data and we can easily get the you know which area which cloud which area is more uh, affected you know we can get a, like a cloud you know uh, on a map you know that I think is easier. For the gener generative AI, you know, we also can use that, you know, nowadays we use the generative AI for, you know, do the digital digital twins of the, you know, of the seating and other uh, other areas. We also, you know, nowadays we use a lot of AI techni technologies, you know, for the design, 
you know, <clears throat> before, you know, we, we need like uh, some companies actually nowadays already use AI um, to, to do the design, you know, for like uh, landscape design and also, um, also the disaster risk uh, management design, you know, this kind of design. You know, we nowadays they train the model and uh, the model can, can get the result very quickly. Also, the model can do the design very quickly. For before, you know, maybe like uh, 10 people can work out 10 days, but nowadays, the AI can do, you know, with the with the big big models, you know, they can do that maybe in like one day, you know. So that is very, very quick and it can save a lot of time. So yeah, I think it's a big data and AI, you know, especially for the uh, disaster risk management, but also for the urban planning, they have very big potential. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, it's it's really mind blowing to think about how we are just seeing the uptake of AI now. And I, I, I wonder in five years, how everything will be different. Um, Sharice, I'm wondering, we have um, a, a question. Um, in terms of building the capacity of surveyors to engage in climate actions, what do you think are the key areas that we should focus on? I'm sorry, you dropped out a bit there. I think oh. my internet is unstable. Can you repeat it? Absolutely, I'm so sorry. But the question was, in building the capacity of surveyors to engage in climate actions, what do you think are the key areas we should focus on? Hmm. Um, well, we should focus on uh, things like um, flooding. As I said, we need to to get them to see how their work engages with the climate change issues um, so they know what they, what is needed of them and not necessarily, as Kate was saying, just using um, standard precisions and high levels of precisions. We need to get data in quickly and we need to get data that suits what the trends are so again, we need to, to speak to people who are engaged in the field, tell us what are the um, decisions you need, and then we can design systems for capturing that data um, ourselves using whatever material, whatever systems. It could be um, satellite imagery. It could be what we would know, the, the precisions that we could obtain from the particular systems, mm -hmm. and they would tell us what they would need out of it. Hmm. And that's really useful. Thank you very much. Uh, Simon, I see you've got your hand up. And a reminder to anybody um, who is in attendance today, please do feel free to ask a question at any time, or if you would like to respond to a question, we thoroughly encourage you to get involved. Um, we, we'd love to hear your voice. Uh, thanks, Roshi. Uh, Sharice, my, my question is is to you, and th and thank you for a very uh, a very interesting um, uh, presentation. And I was just thinking about the fit for purpose tenure uh, issues in 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 the Caribbean, and whether or not um, the climate ch climate change and and disaster recovery and 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 all the things that go along with it um, possibly push uh, push into um, maybe a fit for purpose tenure system where um, all this information is there that needs to be that needs to be um, accessed for not only for disaster recovery and not only for you know climate change issues but but also for the for the land tenure side and and whether or not that then becomes a wider I don't know something like a CARICOM issue rather than individuals the individual states themselves doing it which gives you a bit more um, you know bang for your buck really. Well, you'd be surprised that um, we would look at it as a, a group and we talk about the SIDS of the Caribbean and, and the similarities between all of them. And then when you get down to the local level, everybody says, I'm totally different from Grenada, <laughs> totally different from, from St. Yeah. Vincent. It is totally different. I mean, I had that when we were discussing, um, we wanted to get a template for land policy. 
And we said, well, we're speaking with the OECS countries in a, um, a project there. And we said we can develop a sort of template for land policy for the, all the OECS countries. And you just fit in your what you require into it. And then everybody started saying, well, we are totally different. And <laughs> there's no template that we can have. So um, it, it can be very strange. As I said, the, the technical issue is, is simple, but the social issue is is a difficult part, getting people to see their similarities instead of their differences. Yeah, and so 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 effectively, what it comes down to then is every, everything is is state led rather than region led, or you know the, the solutions become state state solutions rather than overall. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Thank you. You know, it's it's interesting. So I must uh, I must give a, a huge shout out to one of our. Um, Climate Compass Committee members Rigoberto um, Moreno, who is from Mexico, who helped prepare some of these prompt questions that we're using in this particular section. Um, he's put forward one question that I think aligns extremely well with the discussion that we're having now, which is, uh, he says, one of the biggest challenges in mapping human-led activities and rights and uses that are, like, they're not they're not visible remotely through satellite imagery. So what other sorts of data, smartphone locations, things that might be crowdsourced, et cetera, could we use to assist to understand the human land relationship better and work out how to then uh, you, uh, manage land use more sustainably? Open to anyone. Kate, you're having a giggle. Oh, well, like, it's just, you know what it's like when you say open to everyone and everyone's like, oh, I don't want to talk first. Um, I'm also showing my um, um, age perhaps in, how how do you raise your hand in this? I was trying to find that before. Anyway, someone uh, can message reactions, that to me. Reactions. Kate. Reactions. Oh, yeah. there. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, this is, it's not Teams, it's Zoom. It's different. I, oh, that, no, I was clicking the little arrow and it was giving me full, medium or hidden. I was like, I don't know how to, yeah, anyway. Yeah. To your question, Roshni, apologies for that diversion. Um, I think it's a really interesting area, and I don't know, again, if I'll fully answer your question, around how we link formal and informal data sets. And I think this comes up to me time and time again when we talk about SCDM. Um, I did a little bit of research in the Philippines looking at SCDM where it's sort of not in every instance. I think Uganda was like formally adopted. Um, apologies, Charisse, I'm not sure in St. Lucia, but often SDM sort of generated by communities and then there's efforts to link that with city councils and governments. And that interplay doesn't always work that well, either because of political economy factors, um, you know, they don't want informal settlements recognised or because of the standards of data. This was a challenge we had in um, Papua where the Indigenous um, peoples weren't able to, well, initially their data was not in the standard that the government wanted. So that um, interaction. So, that's not fully the answer, but around the informal and formal data sets, I think is really interesting. And that sort of leads into then the crowdsourcing of information and how you can link sort of the, the AI and the, you know, order, more automated data collections from satellite imagery or drones or whatever to crowdsourced information and crowd generated information. Um, and then the, the trust and transparency around where that information is coming from. I put in the chat before something about AI, where I think we often go, okay, AI, AI can solve this, that can find a way, you know, polygons for my houses or similar, but there's a lot of information that can't be captured in AI. Um, and I think there's no good answer. There's a lot of um, data sources out there, um, but it's something we really struggled with with Bangladesh where, um, you know, you can, use proxies to identify where the populations are, but unless you come on the ground and do surveys, household surveys, um, participative discussions, you're not going to know the sort of the dimensions of those communities and what their perspectives around their land is. So I think no matter how good our automated data gets, we still need to make sure we're visiting communities on the ground to capture their data. And I think that can only be done face to face. Mm. Clarissa. Uh, thanks. Just to follow on from Kate, I may have a more updated understanding of what's happening with the social tenure domain oh, model. Yes. So uh, in Uganda, yes, it has been accepted at national level, but you must understand that Uganda has a 1998 land law, which it allows for community uh, land rights 
in a separate system different from what we would call the land titling system. So again, that's the legal and regulatory framework that must be in place in order to allow these things. The other example, of course, is Palestine. I don't know what the situation is now post 7 October, but what was happening in Palestine was STDM was being used as an adjudication instrument in order to bring the understanding of the communities about their land into the first system. Mm -hmm. And then once that inform the information and the evidence was acquired, it was then pushed up into the national system, which was more of a, a, a high-tech um, re uh, requirements. Um, the third uh, uh, area is Nepal, where because of the major earthquake there, uh, and they needed to act very rapidly. Uh, STDM was used to uh, bring uh, people's land rights into a system which had never been documented. And now it has been incorporated into the larger national system. So um, they are, STDM is operating in uh, 10, maybe 20, maybe 30, 40 countries, really in, in different levels of informality to formality. Um, so it, it's not an either or, it's a process. Thanks very much. No, and if I can just quickly respond, I think that's a really interesting insight in terms of embedding in the, the policies and the processes how you sort of build your cadaster. Um, and obviously there's lots of countries where they are multiple sort of systems operating across different types of tenures and they're not always well integrated. So I think that's maybe another um, aspect to your question, Roshni, which is not only how do we get all the data sets that maybe we're not getting now, but then also how are we making sure that they effectively can talk to each other and work together and can be effectively used by, by people. And it's interesting with that, I mean, there's, there's obviously different scales that we're doing this work at. It makes me wonder, um, within Australia, we have um, We have an ongoing debate that occurs at a lot of our national and our regional conferences that you know, Kate and I have spoken about this before around um, to what degree should we have open data so that we can reuse data across um, different projects. And it's hard because often, uh, you know, consultancies might not be willing to share their data, but at the same time, we are all collecting and creating so much data every day that what happens to it when we're done, it sits on a hard drive somewhere mm -hmm. um, and it just gets forgotten. So how could we use our data better? Um, Kate, I'll, I'll pass to you. And then I'm wondering, Professor Chen or Sharice, if you'd like to comment or um, add to that. At the risk of dominating, and I promise I will shut up very soon, I want to morph your question a little bit um, because one of, I think probably something else we've spoken about, Roshni, is um, one of my current bugbears or annoyances is the number of data portals that are cropping up. And this is particularly true in the Pacific. And I would love to throw to Sharice after this to find out if it's the same in the Caribbean, that there's, I think there's three or four new data portals or existing data portals that are cropping up to host data but there's not enough initiatives coming through to... Um, I just sorry, want to interrupt and say Clarissa's comment in the chat that ISIS used land registry data to target people for ethnic cleansing. What? Can somebody tell me about that? Because that's really scary. Sorry. No, no, no. Clarissa, please jump in. Sure. So, uh, you know, when ISIS took over Mosul... Mm -hmm. It took over the land registry even before they'd really taken over Mosul itself. And uh, so uh, they identified all the people who weren't, of, who weren't, let's say, um, Sunni Islamic, and they went and they marked all their houses. And those people all left overnight because they knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the registry was completely controlled and manipulated uh, to put in what would no, be known as a second, secondary occupants. So uh, the Iraq government, national government, did have a disk of the um, first round of uh, owners, but uh, it, it has laws which actually support second occupiers. 
uh, you, a first occupier owner may not throw out a second occupier. These are very complex arrangements in these kind of countries. And I mean, for people who live in uh, democratic uh, rule of law uh, states, you know, be very careful how you design for other countries. So Clarissa, you've done a lot of work in conflict states. What, like, what are some steps that could have been taken or could be taken in the future to try and reduce that risk? Like, do you have any experience or insight there? Um, yes, this is not unusual. The same thing happened in Kosovo. So it really depends if you have a digital system or a paper-based system. If you have a paper-based mm -hmm. system, what happens is uh, it falls back into the hands of private lawyers. And then it takes time, 10, 15 years, to bring the registered rights back into the, uh, the government system. Um, obviously, with digital systems, uh, the, the, the national government, if they're not taken over, if just a hotspot violent area happens, then in theory, the national government should have all the records. But might I remind ourselves that climate causes conflict, Climate change problems cause conflict and they ca it causes displacement. So one of the issues which we haven't talked about here and maybe at another time is how do you manage not only your land registry data uh, uh, during the times of displacement, <clears throat> but also your land tenure claims of your returnees. Mm -hmm. And that's a major issue, um, but uh, along I can give you a, a lot of examples, but we won't talk about it here. Thank you. I, I think you have some really great papers on that. I know there's one that I definitely reference in a, a talk that I sometimes give. So I'll see if I can grab it up and put it in the chat, but feel free to do some self-promotion, Clarissa, because you've done some awesome work there. That is really interesting. And it just goes to show that, you know, as the world continues to shift and change, the impacts of climate will not only be that we see and experience natural disasters, but we will have increasing conflict, as Clarissa says, and the data and the systems that we produce as surveyors will tie into that. And it's important that we think about that now and plan resilient um, systems that we can use to protect as opposed to leave loopholes available. Um, so returning to the question. No, 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 I'm happy to continue on that. I think that's a really like, I, yeah, I don't think it's just loopholes. I think it's understanding how the data can be used for and against people. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the same thing kind of comes with gender-based violence. There's some interesting examples around the world around how land tenure and sort of land titling and ensuring we have documentation of the names of both women and men can in some instances cause gender-based violence and in other instances alleviate it depending on what context what cultural context you're in um, and there's some interesting studies around that and I think it's it all comes back to this I don't know political economy understanding or broader social equity understanding of how the data how data can be dangerous as well as helpful um, Clarissa <laughs> we'll have more to say on that too but um oh, isn't sure. that, it's interesting that um the replication of the data, the recording of the data and duplicating and archiving would help to solve some of those issues because there would be data that you can go back to. In terms of gender-based violence or in terms of conflict or? No, in terms of conflict if or in terms of any kind of destruction yeah. of the, the registry data, which is what I spoke about, that you need to know what would happen and then you can replicate the data or at least record it and replicate it somewhere and store it somewhere else. So anything that would happen, you can recover the data. Yeah, but I guess there's lots of instances where like the people in power have recovered the data and then decided to accidentally lose it or to replace it because they no, don't but you want have it, it you somewhere know. else. And then oh, yeah, um, if there's if there's yeah, enough copies, I guess, and if there's enough uh, robustness in the um, the way it's stored, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, Clarissa and then Simon. I'd like to ask a question from Professor Chen and really just change the subject now. Uh, Professor Chen, I, I do a lot of reviews for land journals and I see an enormous amount mm. of papers from China which are using big data to do 
the to do analysis that I am not seeing anywhere else in the world. Um, I remember a recent one where there was a comparison um, of provinces, all China's provinces, uh, of how their ecological functions were doing uh, relative to each other and relative to uh, the sort of the development ap approach that that province was taking and then assessing how uh, one province would be using another province's ecological systems for their purposes. Um, and, and then I remember doing seeing another paper on um, an, an analysis of the whole of uh, uh, the, uh, the Yangtze River, uh, which is like what, 30% of the population, 30% of the GDP or whatever. I, I don't know the figures exactly now. And showing how uh, the impact of land degradation relative to that river and um, the impact downstream of flooding, the kind of things that you were talking about earlier. <laughs> And I'm just giving you some examples here, and I, I think this audience would really benefit from hearing from you about these, this, the power of the analysis that we're seeing in China that should be being used elsewhere in the world. Can you give us some examples of how this is working out? Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I think this is a very good question. You know, uh, nowadays, first, you know, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of data. I, I think, you know, not only in China, but also in other countries, especially, you know, nowadays in China, you can understand, you know, in China nowadays, uh, you know, more than half of the people, they have uh, cell phones, you know. The cell phones data, sometimes, you know, they can, they can be registered on some um like uh, uh TikTok or other platforms. So it is easy to get data online, you know, for also, you know, for like uh, uh, as you mentioned, you know, we every day we take the like the buses, you know. When the when we take the bus, we registered our data, you know, on the you know, because you use a card and your information is on that card and that your information will be registered on that system. So then people can use that data, you know, to see, you know, like, a, you know, in <clears throat> to link the, the where you lived with the land use and then they can get some kind of information. So that, I, <clears throat> I think, you know, nowadays, first is because the data sources are, are you know, there's multiple data sources, a lot of data sources that we, we can use. The other thing, you know, we can also like, is, you know, nowadays the remote sensing is very, very convenient. You know, as you said, we can, we can do like a, uh, 30 meters resolution of land use data, but nowadays we have one, one, meter data, one meter resolution land use data. Or, you know, we can use that also can, uh, try, uh, can get like a building data, to like uh, settlement data, to like energy related data, you know, we can use a satellite to generate any, a lot of kind of, uh, you know, indicators to about the, the energy, about the livelihood, about well being, about the GDP, you know. So all of these can connect to the social, what we call the social citizen data, you know, from our online use, from our, uh, the, the cell phone use, you know, if we can connect the social sensing data and the remote sensing, remote sensing data, and then we can tell a lot of stories. So I think that that is, the, for, for example, you know, my student, they use a lot of data, the satellite data to, to mapping the, uh, the solar panels in every building and also in every day, you know, in the desert area, they can get, they can see that very clearly. Also, they can, they, they use the data, the remote sensing, remote sensing to mapping the uh, wind turbines in the ocean area. And then they can use that data to, you know, uh, to overlap with uh, like a wildlife, like a birds, you know, the the conservation areas, and then they can also tell other stories. So I think there's a very big potential, you know, for especially for the 
for people from uh, land use, from geography, from these these disciplines, you know, they can use data to do to tell stories. Also, this data can be used, you know, for um, like a disaster management, for you know, like uh, as you said, the conflict uh, to resolve the conflict or avoid the conflict. I think this, yeah, that that has a lot of potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chen. Um, it's interesting thinking about how we can use these broad scale analytics to help us prepare for the future. Um, what do you think, how do you think the way we do analytics as geospatial professionals and surveyors might evolve over the coming five to 10 years? What do you think might be some of the priorities that we'll need to start thinking more about? Uh, this is a this is a big question, you know. I think um yeah nowadays people talk a lot about AI, talk about uh, you know other technique, big data is, you know, these are very, very important. Nowadays, you know, um we have we have a lot of sources to get data, but also we can use this so this this data to do a lot of things you know for example you know in the uh, in 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 china we are trying to you know before you you can understand you know you use the cell phone you the sometime you know they all also use the facial recognition techniques you know nowadays we also use the facial recognition techniques to detect the birds not only the people but also the birds you know, to then you know we can see we can uh, you know uh, from the from this you know we can like uh, very easily calculate for this area how many birds uh, are they and uh, uh, what kind of birds you know the species you know how many uh, what kind of birds uh, and uh, how much is that even we can recognize each bird you know like. Uh, you know, every day, how that, which area they are flying, what are they doing, what is their behavior, you know, so all of this. So I think, you know, in future, you know, we have a lot of space, we, we have a lot of potential to use these, these, these technologies to do the conservation, to do other kind of works. So, yeah, I think we need to, we need to think about, you know, nowadays and to, to think what, if we because we already have these kind of uh, techniques and what we can do you know for the climate change for the uh, for for the uh, biodiversity conservation yeah that's such a good point and going back to um, the very beginning of the presentation during Clarissa's presentation around um, the Rio conventions we definitely heard that there are some important um, goals on biodiversity conservation and um, renewal of uh, degraded lands. So it, this is really innovative ways to address this. Um, Kate? I was just going to add a little bit more um, at a lower level. Like I worked for the New South Wales Department of Climate Change for a little while. And um, one of the key challenges is in habitat classification. We, I can't remember how many different types of habitat we have in Australia, but it's actually quite difficult to determine sort of where exact habitats are just based on satellite imagery. Um, so I think that that could be something that could evolve, you know, like I think that the species counting is really important. Um, we have a bit of a debate in Australia around whether or not kangaroos are actually endangered or not, because it's really difficult to count them uh, with any degree of accuracy. Um, but I think, yeah, going into the habitat classification could be quite interesting um, also. And I was going to make another point, but I've just forgotten it. So let's pass on to someone else. <laughs> No problems. Um, the I'm just going to say to Kate, we've got some possums we can give you, Kate. Oh, I've got enough possums, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the kids in my um, kids' primary uh, daycare heard the thunder the other day and thought it was possums on the roof. So obviously, her family's got a bit of an infestation. 
Um, oh no, that's what I was going to say though. You reminded me, Simon, around habitat change. I think sort of something for the future, Roshni, um, is around sort of this dynamic data modeling with, with AI and moving forward, because obviously climate change is causing habitats to change. Some animals and species are adapting, some aren't. Um, and, you know, some alpine areas are no longer becoming alpine areas. So I think the ability to model that change and sort of maybe predict it in able to be able to protect some species could be quite an interesting um, thing to look at moving forward and I'm sure there's people looking at it um, but yeah I find it quite interesting. It is it really is um, and a reminder as well for any of our participants online we would love to hear any questions you have and if you have anything that you'd like to contribute to the discussion please feel free to just unmute yourself and join in we'd love to see you. Um, my next question is to Charisse um, you know your presentation really made me think about what what uh, you know do we need surveyors to do for the future so I guess I'm curious what do you think uh, are there any special surveying skills that we need for climate action or is it just about adapting our existing skills um, well again I think that um we need to adapt our skills to what the people who are in climate change require. So we, again, it's it's all about being multidisciplinary and um, we don't know what we don't know. And we need to be able to, to speak to other people to see what is necessary. Um, I've done work in, in areas of mapping where we're doing trying to um, look at registering or regularizing informal settlements and we're trying to put in drainage. And it's so surprising that, you know, we just get the, the heights and uh, of, the, dra of the, the surface so that we would think that the drain goes in straight. Um, but, you know, they would tell us that, no, it needs to go in um, at a curve so that you will reduce the speed of the water so that um, um, the, the water wouldn't cause any further slippage and wouldn't cause flooding as quickly in the lower areas. So it was, you know, something that, that needs the meshing of the minds to see how best you can um, mitigate the climate change problems. Instead of just saying as a surveyor, we'll put in a straight drain here and, and just survey uh, how we would anticipate it should look, you know. So that was one of the examples of how we need to be um, in a multidisciplinary team. Mm. And, you know, I'm wondering as well, like, um, how, how would you adapt STDM to put in climate variables? Hmm. How can you adapt STDM? But I can only think of putting in um, the passer's information from the occupants on how often it gets flooded or um, what are the issues of, um, of that may be exacerbated by climate change, people on the coastline, how often it gets inundated, what has been the change to the boundaries on the coastline, because um, those are the things that the we are dealing with, the, um, the encroachment that can actually change the land, uh, the, and the, the amount of land that you have, if you have uh, the, the encroachment of the water onto the, the on the coastline into the people's uh, properties. We're actually losing a lot of land. I'll pass now to Clarissa and then over to Cromwell. Uh, thank you, Roshni. Uh, it's something that uh, is being really discussed uh, and has not been resolved is the issue about the focus on landscapes uh, as by the climate people relative to the focus on parcels by the land people. 
So what we see in, uh, I've seen conversations coming out of the UK, for instance, where their regulations are saying you have to define the landscape piece of land to match exactly all the parcels. You can't have any overlaps. Uh, I mean, that's that's extremely problematic if you're thinking about river basins or whatever. So we heard a presentation yesterday from the Netherlands saying that, yes, that was a problem in the original design of the Environmental Planning Act and how it was going to be implemented. They've solved that problem through massive and very, very clever uh, uh, programming. Um, but uh, they, they, they knew it at the beginning that they had a problem around the boundaries of landscapes versus parcels. So we just need to put that one on the table as in your own countries, just to think that one through. Um, I think in regard to STDM, when we think back on how we did the original designs, um, one of the, th the strong aspects of STDM is that it doesn't necessarily require unique parcels. It can have any spatial extent. And I think that that may be one of the strong aspects that could be used for climate science uh, when they want to collect not only what we would understand to be land rights information, but also land use, land cover, and so on. These are just uh, uh, very early ideas. So I really throw it open to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Clarissa Cromwell. Yeah, I'm following on your question to Dr. Charles uh, a while ago. So one key takeaway um, that I can clearly remember from Orlando last year was, I think it was from Bryn Fosberg, the this passage that our role as surveyors is evolving in a way that most of our future jobs are still unknown. So our competences and skills and capacities are yet unknown to us at this moment. And we need um, to adapt or upgrade our existing skill sets to match those future jobs that we still don't know about. So this example was, I think, the, the robot dog the, that is clearly used now in construction or drones in um, site management, for example. We don't have that kind of skill sets before, but with the use of technology, with the uh, the evolution of um of even of of the of the academia from from our curriculum, we are able to work on that uh, special area. Um, I think when when it comes to SCDM adapting to um climate uh to to include climate parameters, I think uh. gonna be I guess it's gonna be tough because I think uh, since I'm in Europe we have some you know transparency issues we have uh, GDPR ongoing so data are always protected in a certain level so we have open data available but not on its entirety we have um um the cadastre uh, in Italy we have the cadastre parts of the, the cadastre in open data but you can really use that just for you know overlappings with existing plans and you can't do anything else other than that so information are available in different levels and even um on paywalls unfortunately so i think uh, that's another issue we we, uh, we should look on uh, when it comes to data and big data also my personal personal issue because we have light pollution sound pollution I think we're heading towards data pollution. We have so much data available that are not accurate, precise, or entirely useful for a certain way that we, we want to. Or some data are just there or miscommunicated, misinterpreted. So we, we, we as our surveyors, we need to be able to um, filter through all those data and apply them accordingly to our specific um, target projects or case study. That's pretty much it. Yeah, those are some really salient observations there, Cromwell, around, you know, um, as we 
continue to amass vast amounts of data? How do we use it as well as we can? And how do we stop it creating more problems for us? Also recognizing, Roshni, that data itself is causing, you know, contributing to climate change because of the enormous data servers and the emissions from those that I don't think we're adequately accounting for either. No, we're really not, are we? Um, yep, I think data farms can raise some degree of temperature in certain areas of the of the neighborhood. So yeah. we should look at that too. Um, I believe Clarissa has a, a another question she'd like to ask. Yes, uh, Professor Chen, um, I have two questions. You may not have the answers for, uh, but I know from your CV that you have this huge range of knowledge, so let me try. So the first question is, uh, you know, we're walking very gently into, as a global uh, profession, into understanding the link between the valuation of land and natural accounting. And um, I have seen some very interesting papers in China on this issue. Um, and I wonder if you could unpack, uh, if you know anything about this. this is a very specialized area, I'm aware of that, but if you have any further knowledge on that, that would be really interesting. Um, the second question I have is, and I, please tell me if I'm incorrect, but if I remember correctly, you have something like 64 million small scale farmers in community farms. And perhaps you could tell us um, when you do solar farms or wind farms in these areas, and we saw pictures um, in, on, your, on your slide deck of sheep underneath the solar panels, yeah. um, what form of tenure arrangements have you got with these small scale farmers um, which, so that you can have these uh, green energy arrangements? Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Yeah, you have two questions. Very good. You know, <clears throat> for the first one, actually, <clears throat> before, you know, I think a lot of government, they use GDP to measure the economic development. But sometimes we, we can understand, you know, when the, especially in China, you know, for like uh, from 1970s to uh, 2010, you know, these like a 40 year, uh, more than 30 years development, but the Iran, there's a very big environment impacts, you know, the a lot of rivers were polluted, uh, you know, when I remember when I was a kid, you know, we go to the rivers, we can just get the water to drink, you know, but nowadays, you know, you can't, uh, can't imagine you can drink the water just from the, from the rivers. And also, you know, you see in, in 20, 2012 or 2013 at that time, a lot of cities in China with the air pollution is a very big problem. A lot of friends from US, from other countries, they you know they they when they went to China, they they, they think wow the air pollution affect their health. You know some people don't want to come to China because of air pollution. So you can understand you know the air of the eco the. Economic, economic development, you know, the cause of all these problems. So now, you know, in China, we try to, you know, integrate not only the, the economic development, but also the environmental impacts together. That is the natural, I think you understand, the natural capital or the, as you said, the natural accounting system. So <clears throat> they are still developing, you know, in China, we are still developing this, 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 this this kind of a system or this kind of methodologies, but we are already in, in several places like in Xinjiang, in, in, Zhe, in Zhejiang, and in some places we are already, you know, use the natural accounting uh, method to, to see, you know, what is uh, um, the value of the nature in this, in that area. And uh, like, uh, or why government official you know, was the leader of that area after one term the government will um, give an accounting you know for these five years if the 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 value of this area was increased or decreased you know if the value was largely decreased this guy maybe have some problems so we <clears throat> in China nowadays we are we are de developing this this mess this, this kind of method but. Uh, but still, you know, <clears throat> need a lot of work because you know different areas they 
they they need to have different kind of variables, different kind of a, you know rate to to uh, calculate that. You know, like the desert area in China and the coastal area. You know, the methodology, the the variables. You know, everything they needed to be changed. So uh, yeah, I think this is. This is maybe you know in future can be used in other places. As you talk about you know the the you know in China we actually the land uh, right is very interesting you know compared to other countries. You know the land in the urban area that belong to the national government, but the land in the rural area that belong below to the local collective. Uh, you know the 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 rural uh settlement you know the rural villages you know the village the village as a collective they uh, they uh, have the right for the land in that rural area so but uh, there is a problem you know for like uh, the desert areas you know for you have the after you you put the solar panels on the desert you know that that area most of the time you know the that 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 part of land not controlled by the national government but also the local government maybe not far from the villages so uh but still you know there's a problem you know as you can understand for the solar panels if you put on the the um, desert areas the solar panels every month or every uh, yeah, especially in the spring, the winter, spring, in the spring, summer, you know, uh, every one month you need to clean the, clean the solar panels because of the dust will be on, on that. So you, after you clean that, the water will go down the uh, solar panel and a lot of grass will come out. If you, if you don't put the, like a goat or sheep on, Beside that, sometimes you know, especially in the winter, they will cause the fire problem. So the actually, you know, the the uh, sometimes you know they ask the local local farmers, you know, to to set their set their goat, they set their sheep to to the uh, solar stations. But uh, also sometimes you know the company, you know, the company over that solar station, you know, they have some, they buy some goat and say uh, sheep, you know, set to, to that uh, station and then later, you know, they can, they can use, they can eat that, they can sell that. So yeah, I think this is, this is multifunctional land use, yeah, but still, um, yeah, connect a lot of things. But uh, nowadays, as you said, you know, I think uh, <clears throat> also Kate also talked about, you know the 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 solar panels. You know nowadays in especially in China, we also see that on the agriculture land or farmers agriculture land, they also put the solar panels. So that is, you know, the Chinese government actually last year they they said the <clears throat> uh, said said a lot of uh, groups. You know, to, to different part of China to see how much of the agriculture land was occupied by the. Uh, by the solar panels and the at the end they they have one policy you know to to control you know to put the solar panels on the agriculture land yeah i think uh, yeah we, we should uh, control yeah this kind of use okay thank you thank you very much we have a couple of minutes um before we wrap up so i would like to now ask each of our um presenters from today, one final question, which is, what do you think is the biggest gap at the moment for surveyors in our ability to combat the climate crisis? We might start with um, with you, Kate, and then pass over to Sharice and then Professor Chen. No, let's start with Sharice. Let's start with Sharice. Uh, the biggest gap might be one that is not really technical. It's uh, probably interaction with governments. Um, in the Caribbean, we can't um, have, we can't get the governments to accept that they need to do a lot about climate change because they say it's really the responsibility of the developed countries 
and they don't want to expend the cost. They don't think that it, the cost should be applied to the developing countries, the cost of doing, making any mitigation um, actions. So that is the biggest gap. If we propose anything technical, um, we will be, meet that resistance. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Um, I don't know if this is the biggest gap, but it was something that I was thinking about um, interjecting with earlier. Um, and I think it's around understanding different values and worldviews and perspectives, particularly in relation to spatial data. Um, and the context of this particular comment is a recent court case that was decided in Australia um, around the Barossa gas pipeline, um, which is a, a gas project pipeline that was being built off the north of Australia. Um, and there's specific implications for um, Indigenous lands um, and Indigenous people sort of brought an injunction against it. Um, and we're trying to stop it because of the impact on their customary lands. Um, but the finding, there was multiple things in here around sort of expert data and um, sort of leading the witness. and But the really interesting thing for me was around how the judge viewed the spatial data that was presented, particularly in the context of Indigenous timelines. So in Australia, um, our Indigenous peoples have, you know, a, a really long um, spiritual connection to land, um, but that doesn't relate necessarily with present day geographies. Um, and it's a really long winded answer to your question, Roshni, but I think that it's a real challenge for surveyors in presenting information that we present information as objective, particularly in terms of spatial data, but there's a lot of fuzziness to the data. Um, and Indigenous, the, the way that Indigenous peoples understand spatial data and perhaps themselves represent spatial data is different to the way that we typically do it in our standard ESRI software or even in open source QGIS. Um, so, yeah, I think that a real challenge is sort of uh, how we work through addressing the nuance of spatial data, how we present that fuzziness and nuance, particularly linking to Sharice when we're talking to governments where we want them to accept something, but we also need them to understand, you know, we are also scientists and engineers. We need them to understand that this data is not hard and objective. There's um, there's nuance to it. So I think that's a real challenge moving forward. You know, that's interesting because I was speaking to, as part of my work, I was doing some consultation with Queensland government um, last week and we, as part of that we were talking to um, the manager for Path to Treaty and she was talking about how you know a lot of Indigenous people they just they get consulted they get consultation fatigue but nobody follows up with them afterwards about what's yep. actually happened with what decisions are made on their land and country um, and she made a really interesting point there about um, you know First Nations people and their worldviews are often very local, very topological, whereas Western worldview tends to aggregate data to a very high level. And there's implications on, like you say, how we present data as fact. Um, sorry, I'm- And include people stuff. in the decision-making process. No, that's excellent. Let's let's talk offline about that, Roshni. Let's do that. Um, Professor Chen, I'd love to hear your views. Yeah, great. Yeah, so this is, yeah, he, this is a good question. You know, <clears throat> for me, I'm thinking, you know, now there's a big inequality about the data, you know. So some areas, they have a lot of data, like the urban areas. You know, urban areas, in, like in Shanghai, in this small, small, you know, compared to the rural area, you know, in this small city, you know, we have more than 100 uh, you know, uh, climate uh, sta uh, uh, the weather stations. But for the rural area, you know, that is like uh, maybe 10 times bigger than, than the city, but there's no climate uh, uh, the weather stations. So you can see, you know, also other kind of data, you can see there's a very big uh, gap, you know, very big inequality of the data, you know, in in in, in uh, urban area and rural area, also developed countries, developing countries, also you know the uh, you know uh, like uh, refugee areas and the the you know the more <clears throat> urban areas. So I think th this is very very big issue. You know, so how we can uh, you know how we can 
reduce the gap, you know, on the data inequality. I think that is an issue. The other issue, you know, <clears throat> we could talk a lot about the, uh, you know, I think 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we talk about pixelizing the society or so, so, socializing the pixel. But until now, you know, we still see there's a big gap, you know, so a lot of pixels, we don't know what a story happened in that area. But, uh, you know, a lot of uh, also for the population, you know, we don't know in, you know, in the rural area, if that people, if is that uh, that house still have people or not, you know, so we can't link the 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 land use the the pixels with the population movement. So I think that is still you know the a gap you know we can fix in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, much, Professor Chen. And you know, I there is one question that we had in our. Um, yesterday's seminar, the first one, uh, and I'd love to ask, you might know the answer, you might not know the answer, but do you, does anyone here know anything about managing and monitoring sand and dust storms using Earth observation? Yeah, that can be, you know, use a, use a uh, remote system data and also the local data, you know, local Especially, I don't know other countries, but in China we have a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, underground uh, observations, you know, to see like uh, well, the wind to detect uh, to monitor the wind direction and also how much sand come from uh, white direction, you know, that, that can be you know turn around because of the wind wind direction. So I think that easy, you know, if we combine the the local uh, data and also satellite data, that that is not a, not not so difficult. But the problem is, you know, for the local areas, people don't want to share the data. But some most of the time, we can only see, you know, use the, the satellite data. But satellite data, you know, it also like uh, you know for the uh, uh, for the. Uh, light set data or for the sentinel data and you know it only covers that time for you know for this day you can get that data but tomorrow you don't you don't have data you don't know what uh, if the sand storm still there or not not you know sand storm so i think we need to combine all these data together and to see see the change you know see the uh, sand storm and other kind of uh, you know environmental problems evolution. Thank you very much, Professor Chen. Um, Clarissa and I were scratching our heads about that yesterday, thinking, how will we figure out a way to answer this? And, um, you know, it goes to show that this task force, our role really is to find the gaps, not only to find the answers, because the answers will continue shifting over time as well. So really really wanted to just say a huge thank you to um you know sharice professor chen uh kate to cromwell and simon and clarissa um and i'll pass back to clarissa now for our closing i'll have the slide up in a second great thank you very much to everybody as roshni says um and before you exit we also want to have Dana's final presentation uh, to show us what we've been talking about, and then we'll talk about some of the upcoming um, uh, seminars and webinars. Dana, it's all yours. And we're really looking forward to seeing the richness of what you've created. Um, thank you, Clarissa. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, just uh, bear with me while the uh, screen catches up with my screen display. Um, but this is the graphic recording in progress. Um, still a little things to polish up and I will do that. Um, but we've had a great discussion today. I'll zoom into our seminar discussion in the corner, corner here just to give us a quick recap of the discussion and we'll head on off. Um, so Rushni started us with the Kinefin model and introduced us to new, what it kind of means to be a new, novel, unknown, capable decision uh, capability and making decisions and leadership in complex and chaotic spaces. Um, and 
you know, leading through complicated and clear spaces is a much more familiar, known and practised um, space to be in. And so uh, Roshni really called out that the Kinefin model will help us uh, navigate uh, climate action. So as we zoomed into the discussion that really kind of came out in this last part, um, we focused at the start there just thoughts about the global south and the design of the new technology that might be needed um, and easy access there. Um, but it was actually called out that new tech is probably not the solution. It's actually more about fit for purpose data standards and understanding laws and impact impacts practice in these places. Um, we then flew over to um, a bit of a, a discussion around AI. So we have on the other end, you know, for example, China, who has copious amounts of data, um, and they can do uh, use AI to do big modelling uh, in one day when it would take eight people several days. Um, however, again, we need to remember that there's a lot of data and information AI, AI can't capture, and that will still need to go back to the ground um, and get, you know, uh, local surveys done for populations, for example. Surveyors' role um, in climate action, uh, ultimately we need to get better at talking and meshing um, minds in multidisciplinary teams. Um, and we can do, we can bring surveyors along in this journey through showing how their work engages with climate, get them to share their data and not mandate it, and but ask surveyors what do they need to be a part of the climate action space. Um, but really calling out um, in the middle here uh, that you know, it's been a common theme through this discussion, but getting people to see their similarities as opposed to their differences, to come together and work together on these complex land issues and water issues, it's hard. It's ultimately very hard. Now, our final two points here, again, a bit better on data, um, calling out we're heading towards data pollution um, and then the data inequality across city and rural spaces across in China to developed and developing nations. Um, you know, and then we had a we had a little moment of celebration of just kind of experiencing um, China's academic papers doing crazy levels of analysis um, and getting to a point where provinces can see shared ecosystems across their borders. I thought that was fascinating. Um, myself being um, a complex visualizer, uh, these these sort of um, uh, mapping spaces are really engaging for myself. So I'll finish this up. This will be shared out and I would encourage you guys to then review it, remember the discussions today and then share it further. Um, these are all points that we can start sharing knowledges and sharing data. Um, so thank you for having me and uh, back to you, Clarissa. Uh, thanks very much for that, Dana, and uh, really exciting stuff, actually. So Roshni, are you going to do the closing or am I going to do the closing? Um, I'm happy for you to do it if you're comfortable. Yep, I'll go for it. So, uh, Roshni, is thanks to everybody. Um, and it's been a very rich conversation, and we really appreciate people spending so much time on this. But, you know, we all know it's important. It's also important for the grandchildren, as you know. <laughs> and uh, what we want to do now is just to say uh, we, we this, uh, this information from, that is from this uh, seminar will be uh, made available in our FIG Climate Compass uh, YouTube channel. Uh, the recording will be placed there. Um, and so you, you know, you're welcome to share it with many people. Uh, we're also saying that there's still another seminar that will come up tomorrow. Um, and I hope that that's in the LinkedIn. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> well, I hope that that's in the chat so you can see uh, where and when. Um, and then, uh, and there's some very interesting uh, speakers. Uh, for instance, uh, we will have the person from Copernicus, and you'll be able to ask her direct questions on how to use free data, free dashboards, and so on. And many of you have, have already been talking about the use of Copernicus data. Um, uh, we, we're really asking you, please, to join our Climate Compass Task Force LinkedIn page and to add comments and so on and so on. Uh, this is the way that we, we try to reach out to people on a regular basis. We have upcoming uh, task force uh, webinars this year. We'll have two more uh, webinars where um, 
well, we will have three more speakers in each webinar, but they'll only be one and a half hours. Um, and so we, we, we know if you're in the, uh, in, on our LinkedIn page, you will be able to see that. And then uh, we in, in Ghana in May at the FIG Working Week, we'll have a number of events um, and including one event, which will consist solely of the, the organizers that you saw who are our committee, um, who will become a panel and they will talk about what they've heard in these seminars and then try and raise the issue with the audience and take the audience on the journey with us and in, in inspire people to engage as surveyors with climate in, in their own countries. Um, as I said, a recording will be made available. Uh, and um, uh, please, we will now move in. We will now move into our task force meeting. Please, you're welcome to stay with us. You're welcome to join the task force. Uh, there's there's no limit on number of people who can join. Um, and uh, so, what I'm now going to say is. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for Roshni for making the, all the technology work for us. We really appreciate that, Roshni, as well as the facilitation. So uh, I'm now going to close this seminar and we're going to transition immediately into our task force. Thank you for everybody.